In one of the fastest growing cities in the world, a love affair is blooming. Melbourne's residents are talking to their trees. A conversation is unfurling. Dear 1517, I am confessing something very dear to me. I have fallen in love with 1583. Should I leave? Or should I stay? It would be great if you could give me some advice. Around the world, more people are living in cities than ever before. How's it going, 1517? I've been wondering, what's the city like for you? If we change our perspective, we can see that trees are nature's great connectors. When trees breathe, so do we. Each breath, cleaning the air and restoring balance. Our past, present and future are intertwined with trees, yet we have lost the ability to see them. To thrive, we must fall in love again with our city's trees and nurture our urban forests. Hello, 1517. We don't have a lot in common, you being a tree and all. I'm glad we're in this together. Regards, a tree lover. tree. It's your mother. How come you never call? Hey folks and welcome to this week's News in Community Spotlight. Cue the fireworks, we're pleased to announce our next Unreal Community Challenge. Entrants will have four weeks to put together their own VFX display around the theme Spell Our Performance for a chance to win cash, software licenses and more. Head to unrealengine.com slash feed to get started. While on the feed, learn more about how Unreal Engine 5.1's latest features have been rigorously tested on Fortnite Battle Royale Chapter 4. One such luminous feature was Lumen, UE5's fully dynamic global illumination and reflection system. While it may sound like it just added some shine, it allowed Fortnite developers to improve the already beautiful world and create enhanced scalability across platforms and devices. Let's not forget how the new Nanite programmable rasterizer in Unreal Engine 5.1 enables you to leverage features like world position offset, pixel depth offset, custom UVs and more. You can see the system in action in Fortnite Battle Royale Chapter 4. Nanite's latest additions do not come alone. Explore how virtual shadow maps combine with the power of Nanite to render accurate shadows efficiently, from close range to the horizon. 
Learn about these features and more on the feed. Time for this week's Community Spotlights. This real-time Tibetan-style environment with a sci-fi twist is made by 3D environment artist Diane Yi and is phenomenal. They modelled and textured their architecture and dived deeper into their workflow by using many applications to create the best look for assets. We can all agree that this environment showcases beauty, talent and inspiration. Head to their art station to let them know what you think of Temporal. Ever wanted to dance surrounded by hundreds of millions of triangles? Waltz through this fantastic, awe-inspiring scene created by freelance artist Yan Ru. Foxtrot to the forums to learn more about the lumen-lit, majestic ballroom. Sit back and feel the incredibly monolithic music video by Thaddeus Andridis, with vocals by Laura Volt and Kisnu. The concept art by Yasin Violet set the feeling that was used in creating this profound journey of a music video, made entirely in Unreal Engine 5, taking full advantage of real-time rendering and Lumen. Watch and listen to the full music video on their YouTube channel. Thank you for watching, we'll catch you next time. everyone and welcome back to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Tina and today with me I have, as I promised, a panel of wizards who are going to be walking us through some incredible things today. Um, but first, to kick us off, obviously, if you can't tell by the title, we are going to be starting another one of our community challenges. This one is based around VFX and the theme is Speller Performance. So obviously, we're going to be dropping links in chat right now so you can go dive into all of the details. But I did want to give you just a brief little glimpse into what all we're going to be talking about. So first, this challenge, like our other community challenges, is going to take over the span of four weeks. So you have plenty of time <laughs> to learn and put something together. We are also again going to be splitting the categories between the standard and student. So if you're new to VFX or are currently in school, don't worry, there will be a category for you to also shine. Um, again, we'll also be having lots of prizes, just like we did for our other challenges as well. That includes a $1,000 cash prize for the top winner, as well as a bunch of other incredible things, epic swag. If you want the full breakdown of prizes, you can find that on the landing plate page for the challenge. So make sure you go check that out. Um, I did want to talk about a couple of the requirements for the submission. First and foremost, um, our previous challenges, the cutoff timeline was at midnight. We have changed that. So please, please make note of this. The cutoff time is at 7 p.m. Eastern now. So please, <laughs> if you were banking on the typical midnight turn in, it's not that anymore. It is seven now. So don't forget, I would really, really hate for, um, you to forget and then maybe accidentally submit a little bit later. So make sure you make a note of that, please, please, please. Um, for video requirements, they have to be between 10 and 60 seconds of content, be a minimum of 1920 by 1080 resolution, and it cannot contain any post-production editing. However, obviously you can use any kind of video format in the engine itself. So feel free to use any of those tools at your discretion. Um, what you will be scored on for this challenge on a scale of one to five points is in the following criteria, visual effects of up to 10 points, composition, conveyance of mood and atmosphere, as well as use of theme. So there's all of that. Um, there's plenty more details, but I don't want to spend too, too much time going over all of it because you can get everything worded much better and <laughs> much more succinct in the post itself. So please go check that out if this is something that you're interested in doing. Now, oh, so I could take a breath. With that all aside, I would like to take a moment to introduce our incredible guest for today. First up, um, Eric, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Eric Ketchum. I'm a senior effects artist uh, 
uh, working on Fortnite currently. Um, I have been at Epic for about mm, nine years in April, I think. Um, before that, my background is actually in, uh, my master's is in lighting design and technical production uh, for live theater. So for many years before I came to Epic, I was a educator and a theater professional working in regional theaters in the East and in New York. That's awesome. Congratulations on almost a decade at Epic. I did not realize. That's awesome. <laughs> and then next uh, up, we have Jan. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jan Kaluza. Um, I have not been at Epic for 10 years. I'm relatively new. I just joined in um, last year, late last year. Uh, I'm a senior tech artist uh, currently working on Fortnite. Um, you may have met me around the community and community over the years because I've been with the Unreal community pretty much since the start of UE4. Um, yeah, um, that's enough about me. Juan? <laughs> now you're one of us. We have pulled you into the world. <laughs> Awesome. And Next I'm, up, uh, we have Juan. Would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Juan Collado. Uh, I've been for five years as a cinematic effects artist, working on uh, most of the cinematic trailers for, for Fortnite. And uh, prior to that, I was a level designer for like 10 years or so. Um, I've been working video games for the last like 15 years. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> You're all so modest. <laughs> These are incredible things you all have done. And you're like, oh, well, you know, I've done this, I guess. <laughs> oh, I love the trailers. I'm really proud of all the trailer work. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but certainly not least, we have Matt. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, thanks, Dina. And uh, I'll leave the modesty at the door. Uh, yeah, you know, like, I've been <laughs> Uh, and I, I'm I'm a visual effects technical artist on the Unreal Engine special projects team. So we create a lot of the demos and next gen experiences that push the engine and the technology forward. And then I'll help out Juan every now and then on some Fortnite stuff. And I've been here now, I guess, three and a half years, something like that. And uh, I've been working in film and animation and video games for almost 15 years now, kind of doing things from live action feature films to full CGI uh, animations and big AAA video games to now kind of this, this world of, of developing the tools and technologies that create these games that you're about to use for this challenge. So uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here and I can cover a little bit more of, I think, I hope we all cover a little bit more of our journeys and how we got here. And, you know, I, I think some of you might be really experienced, some of you might just be starting out and it's great to get this talented group of people together to kind of talk through visual effects. It's such a crucial part of this final frame in any of these productions across movies, video games. So there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. And I, I cannot thank all of you enough for being here today to give some tips and tricks and best practices and, and stuff like that to some of the people who could potentially be doing the challenge and maybe give them a little, a little leg up. Um, so make sure if you haven't already come with notes prepared, um, make sure you take them. This is going to be a really great stream, just chock full of so much information. So be ready <laughs> for that. And then last but not least, um, we will also have a short segment with a video from some of our friends over at Side Effects going over some stuff from them as well. So we'll be um, playing that a little bit later in the show, but keep an eye out for that as well. So. To kick us off, Matt, I think you brought us a couple things for us to look at, right? You want to kick us off here? Yeah, absolutely. And Dan, yeah, you can play that. Right? So I to uh, start off. Five demo and episodes of Love Death Robots that were done in Unreal Engine and. There's a team here at Epic and we really try and push the boundaries of what's possible. And a, a lot of that, you know, is lighting and rendering and certainly a big part is visual effects animation. Lots of explosions, and magic, and fire, and water, and technical things like how does a car crumple when you run into a building and, and math problems that are really tricky to solve like fluid simulation. 
So we will work together in a team to, to kind of try and innovate and, and bring you new tools and technology that we're going to show you today. And I just wanted to kind of show some of the flashier work that gets produced and inspire you guys because, you know, I think this has been a field that has really tantalized my, my, my senses, you know, like creating visuals that are abstract and emotional and feel, but without some of the traditional tools that character animation brings us, how can you make a magic spell uh, feel like something? And that's a little bit of the art and craft that goes into this. And, and I hope you guys can kind of um, get inspired by us here today and try and push yourselves to, to think of this as like a, a real artistic medium that you can elevate. And in a way, you know, we're going to be looking to you guys, to the next generation, to really take these tools and this foundation that we've been building and, and, and blow, blow me out of the water. That's why I want to come and I want to show you guys some of this stuff. And, um, so, and just a, a little bit of background, like the journey into games and AAA video games, especially for me was a long one starting doing car commercials at Los Angeles for a long time and then high-end animation at Blur and then went over to Naughty Dog and was doing AAA video games. And now like, you know, after starting a computer graphics company called Beyond Effects, like I'm here at Epic. And I think, you know, it's a long journey you can be on in this industry to find your place, find a community that you like and something you're good at. And so like, I, I just wanted to show you some of this cutting edge stuff. Like here's some fluid Sims and rocks blowing up. And, you know, we're, we're really trying to innovate and come up with new techniques to help, help basically make video games on the same level as film rendering. And I think we're pretty close. I don't know what you guys think, but I would definitely want to kind of go into an example today of a really like high end, um, sophisticated Niagara effect that you could try and aim for if you were so inclined and maybe a, a little, uh, risky. I think uh, some of this stuff we do, like you can see some of the R&D here is highly technical and can involve a lot of math and computer science and programming. But there's also an extremely artistic side to all of this. And I think it's that combination that has really kept me and hopefully you guys um, interested and curious about what this, this specialty, this world of visual effects animation has. And a lot of times it's just like just shooting stuff with guns digitally, which is kind of fun sometimes. <laughs> Explosion. And you would be surprised everybody needs this because visual effects, you know, it, it has a bunch of uses. It, it, it dazzles, it distracts sometimes, but it also gives actions in a game world weight, which is really important. And so, you know, you'll find yourself in a lot of gameplay discussions if you're working in AAA video games. You know, how do you make this gun feel good? How do you make this, this special attack uh, read well? How do you make an enemy become visible so you can you can see them at any angle? Lots of these little challenges and tasks are kind of what we ended up coming to visual effects artists. And they're really the, they tend to be the kind of um, ultimate generalist a lot of the times where it's a real combination of animation, modeling, texturing, lighting, programming, and you kind of have to be really good at at all of this. And it's why it's a very challenging discipline, but also one that's hard to find people. And, you know, if, if as you're doing this challenge, you find yourself really intrigued by this, uh, keep exploring it because, you know, it's a really great, it's, it's a really great avenue and, and it can bring you a lot of cool collaborations, awesome projects and amazing puzzles to solve. So what I want to do next is, Dan, if you can play that magic video. So I made a little like spell here that's kind of some high end kind of magic effect that looks like like super next gen, right? And you can see a little behind the scenes. So there's a, you know, a magic spell that goes off and the rocks underneath crumble and it's gray box, you know, it's just kind of a, something to dazzle, something to inspire. And this uses some of the newer Niagara features like fluid simulation to be able to affect millions of particles through a, an evolving 3D simulation, as opposed to um, just kind of having these vanilla points that fly out with mass and gravity. Now we can have every point interact with each other and create these beautiful swirls and tendrils. And uh, I want to show you a little bit of what this looks like inside Unreal Engine and just go over on a really high level um, how I approached this kind of stuff. And this might be very uh, difficult to do if you're just getting started, but I think it's still nice to see where you can go. And I know there's some of you out there that are going to see this and, and be able to do it better. 
And that's what I'm really hoping for. So I want to kind of demystify some of this higher end stuff. I'm going to um, pop open Unreal Engine now. So you've seen that magic video. Dan, if you want to switch over to the streaming. Here I am going to play this back. So here's this little effect. It goes off. We blow away that guy. Mannequin. This poor man. Uh, and you can see I can stop. I can pull out. We can fly around. Let's play it again. And so, you know, this is this full 3D simulation. You can see it's a fluid simulation that's affecting these particles. They're swirling around. There's a little bit of volumetric rendering going on. Uh, and there's also even a, like, a liquid simulation, a little flip simulation that's playing in here to give some, like, nice secondary motion. And this is not the kind of thing you would maybe do for a production video game because it's going to be expensive, but it is the kind of thing you might do for a cinematic um, or maybe a challenge like this where no one's really um, giving you any limitations. And I wanted to just kind of demystify this a little bit, right? Like, what did I do to, to create this? Well, you can see I've got uh, a sequence, a level sequence, that basically is controlling everything here, this plasma explosion level sequence. So I open it and I've got a kind of camera cut and I just have these different particle effects that are placed in the world. And these mannequin guys, by the way, I just keyframe them so they go away. <laughs> you can see a visibility track here and they just pop off and it, it looks just as good as, uh, as something more sophisticated. And the, there's this cool creator animation, which I want to kind of cover and demystify. And, um, there's a Niagara effect. Let me let me grab this guy. So you can see here, if I was to grab this first one, this first little explosion, we can kind of deep dive in here, pull this open. And again, this is going to seem a little overwhelming, but I just want to show you kind of um, how many elements and how many different layers it can take to get something kind of sophisticated. And hold on, see, we're opening Niagara. We're going to compile the system. It's going to take a little while. And um, you can see here there's these different emitters. There's the particle source. There's the spawner. This is the fluid simulation. So if I solo this, um, and let me just grab, let me grab this one. Just reopen this real fast. Live demos are awesome. And this guy is just this element here in the center. Well, I don't know. That's weird that's not showing up. The one thing you will find very quickly is you will spend a lot of your time debugging. I would say oftentimes <laughs> experimenting with Niagara, there's about 30% of this hyper-creative work and then 70% trying to figure out what's going on with these systems. So if that happens to you, don't feel crazy. Uh, just know that that is like totally normal. and. I think the issue here is I've actually just grabbed the wrong one. It is definitely part of the process. This is part of the process. Yep. Juan's going to show you the same. So, okay, here, here's, here's that's the, uh, that was the swirling ground thing. So you can see there's actually quite a few layers to this one. So there's many different elements. And I just want to show you really fast how, how kind of you can layer things together to produce a pleasing image, right? So here you can see I've got some electricity going off. And we'll add... Well, we have a shock wave, just a little thing, a little flash. And you know, using these animation principles of follow through and overlapping motion, you'll be able to create something that's, that's really satisfying. And, and this is a lot of what VFX or effects animation is, is just taking these animation principles and applying them to something that's like more abstract, magic, water, fire, explosions. And it's really beautiful. And actually, you know, if you read a book on animation, um, you, all these things apply. And if you're an animator that's studying, you can directly translate all of those different skills and techniques into, into this skill set as well. And I think what you'll see with what Eric's made is, is how kind of beautiful and harmonious these emotions can be from your animations. This is a little bit more of a just big explosive in your face, but you can see how many layers I have, you know, here comes some decals and they're on the ground. And by stacking these things on top of each other, you end up creating like this thing that is a beautiful sum of the parts. And that is a lot of where the magic comes together. And you can see all these different elements, there's many more I haven't shown you, create 
this kind of this big thing, which is running a little slow because this is open twice. That's a that's a big tip for speed, by the way, while you're working. Uh, close the close the Niagara editor, and you will be you will be favored. But I want to talk also about um, the ground splash, the or, sorry, the ground cracking, because I think that's something uh, I would love to see more of you guys doing. There there are ways of bringing these rigid body simulations into the engine. You can see here, I'm just playing this back, and this was done in Houdini, and I'm going to show you the setup for that soon. But here I'm playing back a little rigid body simulation that's fracturing the ground. And this is all just a skeletal mesh. And you can see I can author these in side effects Houdini over here very easily, right? So here is a little thing. It's fracturing the ground. This is a setup. And again, all of this is pretty advanced stuff. This is just to show you what's possible. And you might be starting from nothing and think, well, oh my god, how do I get there? But I'm telling you, you can. It just takes a little bit of time. And tools like Houdini and Niagara are going to be your friend. And so, you know, you make this, you make this little simulation, you're happy with it. OK, that looks cool. And then you're going to go to, if anyone's familiar with Houdini, there's actually um, this ROP node where you can basically output, um, you can output like the, the FBX animation. So if I was to go to out and I type labs RBD to FBX, you can see here, I can actually just grab, I can grab the top node of this guy. And then you can write that out and it'll make a skeletal mesh that will come into Unreal Engine just like this. So now you've got this amazing ground cracking simulation to add some, to add some energy to, to your effect. And you can see it's really simple how, how this works. It's just sitting there in the ground, you know, whoop. <laughs> oh, look, it's even emitting fluids as I move it around, which is pretty cool. And this is kind of like just some really advanced, flashy, um, high-end examples of what's possible now in Unreal 5.1 with Niagara and Unreal. And I think you can push this even farther. But these kind of little demo scenes really show well. You know, it's just it's just um, a little camera movement and uh, some effects animation, maybe some overlap. Um, you know, these characters they they help ground something. I would definitely say destroy the mannequin guy. He's like. He gets very abused here at the studio, and <laughs> it. Uh, this is this is a great way to to start thinking about how you might approach these challenges, and I think you can be much more creative than this. But this was kind of um, something that I, something I came up with for for approaching like um, a simple magic spell example, and yeah, so like that's kind of what I wanted to show. That's what I wanted to show, and I'll kick it back to to you, Tina, and we can kind of answer questions or move on and circle back to this at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple questions just in relation to what you just talked about that I figure I'll throw your way real quick. Um, but the main one is uh, Logan was wondering, could the ground effects be done in UE with chaos if they didn't have any Houdini experience? Yes, and I would say experiment with that. Um, it's going to be a little less stable and cacheable but it's all there. You know, we blew up the bridge on the Matrix Awakens with chaos, and it looked gorgeous. And I definitely think for fracturing and um, start there and see what you get. You know, again, there's no right way to do any of this. It's more the tools you know, the tools you like, and Unreal Engine becomes more and more capable every day. And the the chaos system is incredible. And I, I definitely encourage you to start there if you wanted to try and copy this. Awesome, fantastic. Um, although as, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, as a little, little sidebar off of that, please do play around with chaos. Cause it's, I don't know if it's just the name that personally draws me in, but it is one of my personal favorite systems. <laughs> However, very accurate uh, for anybody name. That is, yeah. yes. Yeah. For sure. Anybody who is interested in trying out Houdini, um, they are kindly offering two months free for users. Um, we're going to be participating in the challenge. So if you're interested in trying it out, give it a go. See how it goes. Yeah, I should note that Houdini, for me, daily is a very crucial tool that I use I use in conjunction with Unreal Engine almost every day. And it's, it's really invaluable. And the two products work together really, really well. And I definitely would encourage anyone out there who's 
enjoying Unreal Engine to also dabble in Houdini because I think they're very complementary and um, it's a great way to, to reach a more advanced level with your setups, techniques, and execution. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, one other question, and then we'll I'll take it away. Um, but Jenkins is wondering how's performance with uh, VATs versus skeletal. Um, you know the 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 VATs, the vertex animated textures, are always going to be more performant because they run on the graphics card, whereas the skeletal meshes are going to be running on on the CPU. So if you're really trying to push performance for for a game, doing vertex animated textures is great. There's just a few downsides to them, like you know you can't really um, interface with them in the same way you can as a skeletal mesh through Unreal's other systems. It's very straightforward to bring a skeletal mesh into Niagara and spawn particles off of it, or um, manipulate that data in Sequencer really easily, you know, and blend clips together, set up the timing. All of this is possible with vertex animated textures as well, if you experiment and come up with some clever techniques. But I find that for simplicity, the skeletal mesh approach is, is great. But for things like water splashes, blood splashes, um, and, and tons of things I haven't thought of that are pretty small. I think vertex animated textures are great, and we use them actually all the time on on real games and real productions here because they're so performant. But they have um, a limit, right? Which you're probably noticing, which is that well, you, you got to fit everything into an 8K texture. So there's only so many verts and so many frames of animation you're really going to be able to do. Whereas the scale mesh approach is unbounded. You know that that simulation of the ground cracking is is quite detailed and features. Um, you know, millions of polygons that are being transformed in, in real time. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's also, right. to, to add to that, there's also the, you know, using geometry cache straight out of um, whatever program you're doing your simulations into, which has its own sort of drawbacks and, and benefits in its own way. But you you have that too as another as another venue to really like push forward on on the quality level of what you're bringing into the engine. Juan is very familiar with the Alembic file cache <laughs> the cinematics that, that gets used quite often. And again, that's actually quite really often. great, which is like, you know, interfacing between different software programs, that, that's obviously like a big challenge for artists using Unreal Engine is that you're, you're still making a lot of your content somewhere else. And you're bringing it into Unreal Engine and it's, it, it functions oftentimes as like an incredible scene assembly tool. And Alembic is an amazing resource, by the way. And if none of you have heard of that, and you're using Blender, or you're using Maya, or you're using some DCC app, and you just want to get the thing you're doing in there into Unreal Engine, that is going to be the most straightforward way to do it. And to be honest, if you're not making a real-time game, uh, use it. There's no, there's nothing wrong with it. It works great. It has motion blur support. Uh, Juan will give you the details. I, I, I'm here as the dark side of everything where performance is... <laughs> is second to final frame output so don't but i think it is an interesting uh, you know <laughs> facet of, of this line of work where there's there's kind of this split right between things that have to perform for a game and things that have to look really nice and you'll often find yourself handling both scenarios right when you're working on a cinematic like at epic like with Juan, there's not a huge performance constraint other than don't make the other artists miserable but when you're working on a video <laughs> game, uh, everything has to be running at 30 FPS or 60 FPS. And there's massive restrictions of what you can do. And you know, you, you realize that changes, that changes everything from the way you approach problems to uh, you know, just how many particles you can use to the types of shaders you can use. And in a way, that's really where the line, I think, is, is drawn in between games and film and animation is just like games. It has to run, it has to run fast. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that quick demo, Matt, and those beautiful videos of just some of the most gorgeous <laughs> effects ever. I personally really love magic stuff too. So deep diving a little bit into the, the intense magic explosion made me very happy. So thank you for that. <laughs> you got the eye candy videos and for then, sure. <laughs> yeah, that was my job. Sure. But you guys out there in the community, like, blow me away. You know, I, I think, you know, 
I'm, I'm an aging dinosaur. I want to see what you create. Be original. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm really excited. I think, you, you know, there's nothing standing in your way. <laughs> Absolutely. So next up, I know, Eric, you also brought a couple of examples that you wanted to uh, walk through with us, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I spent the last uh, little bit creating, um, essentially doing the challenge in 24 days or 24 hours over two days. Um, and I wanted to keep things sort of um, not simple, but but enough of a um, approachable aspect. Um, a lot of what Matt is talking about, um, you know, on, on Fortnite, we have to hit 60 frames per second. Um, and we are constantly looking at special projects going, I want to do that. And we sort of have to, to figure out how to do some of those same things when the game itself limits us on what we can actually put out there. Um, and I also wanted to show that you don't have to use mannequins or fancy, <laughs> uh, you know, fully rendered scenes to do your stuff. You can, a, a square and a, and a cube, a, a sphere and a cube, you're good. You're <laughs> um, so one of the things I, I so this, the idea behind this is I'm really not using any sort of advanced techniques in this. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of material work um, and then just some really nifty setups that uh, I'm gonna sort of demo in Niagara. Um, but this is sort of the basic thing. And it's also, you can sort of see the difference between sort of like the explosion and sort of that just sort of soft magic feel. Um, I think when I was doing this, I was thinking, I want this to look more Disney than Fortnite. So I want something a little more ethereal, magical, as opposed to something more grounded and physical in nature. But at the same time, you know, it, it, the more grounded your stuff can be in the physical world, the more people, even when you're doing magic, it's the reason uh, Matt's uh, magical explosion looks so good because it feels real. When you look at it, you're like, I, okay, I understand what's going on here. Um, I guess, so let me just sort of run through, uh, if we want to switch over to my stream, um, I can just sort of show you uh, what what I have set up in here. Um, the first thing uh, I did, and I will point out, I did this in 24 hours, and I would like even today I'm going, wow, I would change like 500 things. <laughs> but at a certain point, you do have to sort of stop and be like, okay, I'm doing it. Um, so in here, I was just sort of showing sort of the you know the the finger of God or the God rays that you see uh, in some effects to sort of just sort of give this magical like glowiness to it. Uh, this is one of those things where I probably would have, I have some static spotlights that are just limiting the scene. I probably would not use those and I would rely entirely on the a spotlight from the particle system. But, you know, I needed light to work in a blank. Um, and this is literally an empty level. Um, what you see here is very simple of what I have in here. Um, so for, for these guys, it's literally just a, uh, um, it's just a material that I am sampling uh, a texture that is gives me a sub UV of four different light beam effects. Um, and that's literally the simplest you could possibly do. I have a depth fade on here to, so it doesn't, you don't create a, a hard line when those um, light rays go through the, the cube or the sphere here. Um, so that's it's literally just you know I'm saying hey take a random thing from my my sub UVs pick one play it um, in this case I'm velocity aligning them so I have a small just a very teeny amount of velocity on these and if I pull out from the actual camera and this is also a really good um, if my camera will move there we go oh, it's because I'm in sequencer isn't it. Well, that did not did not want me to do that. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so you can see, like up here, I'm not concerned about what this looks like because it's never in my camera. Um, in a game setting, uh, if I were doing something like this for Fortnite, I would definitely probably put some sort of it would be attached to a source, or it would be there'd be a flare of some sort that's sort of magically the source of this object. Um, but so that's, it's always good to keep in mind when you're working on projects like this, if, if you can give yourself a fixed camera, 
great. Um, even even with for something like this, I could even get um, a camera that orbits this without worrying about what's on the, the above the camera's uh, full stream there. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out for here, uh, there is if you look in here, one of the things to me personally that really reads makes something feel real are the little secondary medium and small details that get into an effect. Um, so in this in this little light ray, I have these little dust motes that sort of appear and disappear in here. And in the Niagara system, all I'm doing is I've given it, given it a cone um, that aligns essentially to the cone of the, the span of my light rays, creating that shape. And in this particular case, I'm actually creating the same cone with a kill particles so that my dust motes, which are completely emissive, um, don't render way over here. So they don't get pushed out there. So if I kill this, may show up. You can see like right on the edges where it's black, you're starting to still see those little dots of, of color. Um, I didn't want that because the idea is that the light is, the motes are being picked up with the light. So we have that. Um, there's also some great, um, if you want some of that motion that uh, Matt was showing with the fluid sims and stuff, there's uh, curl noise force and vector noise force in Niagara, which create that sort of vector fieldy uh, moat, like random randomized motion in the world that can give you just a little bit of, of life to stuff. Um, the lifting energy that I have down here uh, below the, the cube right now, uh, that was sort of my attempt to give the idea that a, like a magic wind is pushing this up this is one of those things that I would absolutely fix <laughs> going forward. I'd want it to come like more for, from further away from this thing. Uh, but this is literally just a mesh. Um, it is a mesh that um, this is one of those things that when you start working in game, when you, you're concerned about FPS, you start finding these tricks. This is a mesh. It is spawned one time and it lives forever, and I'm controlling the um, opacity of it. So I'm you know, paying the cost of that mesh one time, and I'm controlling the opacity of it. Um, so, that's, you know, so that's the first section. Uh, and then we get into this sort of pulsing, Let's see if I can turn the, uh, turn this cube off temporarily. Where is it? There it is. There we go. Um, so here I've I'm actually uh, this is uh, sort of a really fun way uh, to link your your emitters to sort of think progressively. Um, what Matt was talking about as far as building small elements together. This sort of started as okay. I want some some sort of sparkles that come toward the this, this sphere to sort of make it seem like it's absorbing this energy in the world. So I started literally with, um, if I solo it, just these flares that just sort of fly in. Um, and I'm really just achieving that by driving the um, a shape location over the life of the particle. So I have a torus that's a very large torus in the world that just sort of slowly shrinks over its life toward the sphere, which is what is giving me these um, these little elements. And then I started um, adding for that. So the first thing I, that I wanted to add was um, some ribbons to give, the, to give it some, you know, some pull, some life in the background. Um, I know Jan is going to talk about some of the, so the tricks and the materials, but this is essentially uh, just some sort of energy material that's applied to the ribbon. Um, and I'm actually using sample particles from other uh, from other emitter, which is a common uh, Niagara node. That basically I'm pulling information and spawning my particles from the location and information provided by those initial flares. So you can see that the tail is actually getting that color from um, from there. So it's a white uh, ribbon originally, and then this is actually sampling the color of the flare so that the, I don't have to worry about trying to match those colors later on. <clears throat> um, and then the next thing I want, again, I, I said earlier, I was thinking Disney. So this was 
one of those is adding sort of that Tinkerbell sparkle to, um, to all of it. So in here, I'm sort of doing the same thing. I'm, um, I'm spawning from the other emitter. Um, I'm pulling the color information. In this case, I'm also sort of going down here and see, my color. I'm taking that color and then I'm back basically hue shifting it. So uh, it might not, yeah, it's coming through. The, the sparkles are the blue and the pink that these two little magical things are, but they also have slight variations of that color. So it looks a little more dynamic as opposed to just having like, like all one color, all one color. <laughs> um, and then the final thing for, uh, well, the final two things here sort of work together. This pulse that is um, essentially happening is actually being triggered by the death event of my, my flare. So I have an event that it triggers when they, that particle dies. And this is literally just a, um, it's uh, just, it's just a, a little shield, a little round uh, hemisphere mesh that has a, a, a line going through it that I, that sort of times itself with that um, element. Uh, so it's spawning living for a, a certain number of seconds as it pans through and then dying there. And then the same, uh, the same is true with this little pulse. So I have the, the hard line. It's sort of like the moment of impact. And then the, the, this chroma pulse element, which is literally just a sphere um, that I've got some material running through. Um, it just sort of like pulses with that same beat. Um, go back here and go to this next one. Um, so again, with this one, I was sort of using the music that I sort of found to drive some of this. Um, let's see if I can get, go back to you. So this one was the idea that we're having the energy is starting to build up, becoming going critical. Um, this is something again, sort of really simple. It's uh, it's a, a mesh I've created that's just um, splines that are in in a configure like a donut or a torus configuration. Um, it doesn't want to keep playing. Um, and again, we're panning panning a material through that, and then just using uh, my the rotation of the mesh in the engine to sort of give that, to drive that. Um, and it's, um, this particular one is timed to a specific thing, but it's um, running through there, giving some spawning these things, just sort of giving that chaotic energy. Um, the the sparks that, I, that are coming off here, um, they're, uh, again, I'm using sort of that, that idea of when something dies, you're producing other another set of particles. So if I were to ping this one, um, you can just see it's just sort of little sparks that are popping on there. And in this case, I'm actually sampling the sphere itself to drive the location of that. So it's spawning those particles directly on the surface of the, the triangle of that, that object. Um, this would be really helpful if you're, um, we do this all the time on Fortnite when you are dealing with characters and stuff, and you want some magical things to come from them, uh, this is how we do it. It's, it's it's usually a skeletal mesh, not a static mesh, but the idea is essentially the same. The setup is essentially the same. And then from here, I'm, I'm driving those little extra sparkles that are going in there. You'll notice there also, you know, the idea of, of when you're working on these to sort of keep developing and, and extending your idea forward. So in this case, I'm going, well, we want critical information. So I don't want those, those flares to look like Tinkerbell, <laughs> those sparks to look like Tinkerbell anymore. This is critical, we're, we're driving that. Um, so that's essentially what, what uh, is going on here. And then as we go along, we start having that flare build up. Um, the flare, my apologies to everyone who works on Fortnite for this. I'm giving away our flare secret. Uh, our flare oh, is, no. is so, uh, a flare is, is actually three, three sprites. Um, but you'll see, I have three sprite renderers on my one, one emitter. This is a great way for, from us for a standpoint, this is a super cheap emitter. 
because it's um, it's literally I'm only spawning them once, but it's also giving me three renders for the price of one. Um, the only thing I have to worry about, um, and this is sort of a crucial thing to keep in mind when you're working with Niagara, is there are these bindings in your render, and they are by default they're set up to work just sort of out of the box. But you can always, if you want things to look different, you can absolutely create your own, uh, you know, create your own parameter and set information in there, and then in your um, setup you can actually set up those parameter bindings separately. So all of these renderers share position, uh, but this particular one, the Corona on this guy is has its own color, so, which is separate than the color of the other two renderers. And in this one too, I also have uh, that little sort of golden yellow light that's turning on underneath this. And that's also, you can see here, I'm driving that separately a little bit too. Um, so, you know, I have the, the flare, this is, um, that builds up over the time. And then finally I have my own little explosion and gets that position. Maybe it'll let me auto activate this guy. There we go. So, um, sort of pulling out a little bit here, you can see this is, um, just, and it's a very simple explosion. Uh, this would be something that, you know, if I were, if I were working on this further, I might go into taking some of the fluid sim stuff that Matt was doing and get some of that goopy, like give more of the detail of that sphere sort of exploding outward, uh, during this. But all this is, is, is essentially, um, a series of meshes and a couple of sprites. Um, if we do this, this is the big tunnel. Um, the tunnel effect. So it's essentially just um, a flat uh, spherical mesh that has a hole cut out in the middle. Um, and then that is what is generating all of this stuff. The heart, the heart spikes, it's just a manipulation of the flare shape. Um, the soft, these soft spiky meshes, it's literally just, it is a single mesh with all of these things that are just splines that I've thickened up here. And then there's just the soft flare, um, which is actually a duplicate of the same flare that was there before. Um, just, I'm allowed to sort of pop it out a little bit further here. And then just letting those come together. And this, this is, you know, what Matt was going on about earlier was this is about just sort of building those small elements to finally get this something much greater than the each individual piece. Um, and then the last one, uh, just as a, a reminder, um, materials will sort of help you solve a lot of problems. So in this case, the uh, sphere itself, I have a material on that I'm driving the color that changes to a gold color. And then, um, it slowly builds in intensity, that gold, as the flare comes on. So this, that yellow circle you see in the center there is actually the, the, the sphere mesh itself. It's not the, the flare itself taking over yet. Um, and then the, the cube uh, has the same material on it. So I'm driving that material in this, in this sequence separately from a Niagara effect. So just keep in mind, effects can be more than just what's in Niagara even though I could have technically taken these meshes and put them in Niagara as well to do this, to this, the same idea. Um, yeah. So uh, if there's anything that anyone saw um, that they have questions about, um, if you want to write them in there, I can take them at the end, or if there's some immediate questions that have come up now. Yeah, there's a few, if you're open to answering sure. a couple that have come in. Um, so we've got one from, uh, Manus Potex, they're wondering, does this technique with multiple spirit renders and one emitter make it render as one, so there's no overdraw? There's still, you're still rendering each of them separately. Um, so there still can be, uh, there still would be overdraw. Um, the cutout uh, functionality that we have in Niagara will help significantly with that. Um, this is more, the, the sprite renders stacked like that is more about 
the initial uh, cost of, of activating that effect in the game or on screen. Absolutely. Um, and then Joe Burns was wondering, is the flare effect the same concept used in the lifting energy in this case? Um, they're seeing that refractive kind of chromatic aberration or flare effect a lot more these days. Yes, yeah. Um, a lot of those, uh, I'm pretty sure the corona uh, in the flare complex that I made and the lifting energy both have a chromatic aberration set up in them. Um, I can show you how I do it for the, the where'd my content browser go? It's hiding. And of course, make sure you name things correctly. Because <laughs> control <laughs> control um, space bar will help bring it up too. Uh, if the, the quick content browser. That might be one of them. What happens when you work on all these? You don't remember which one spotlight has the <laughs> lifting mesh. <laughs> lifting mesh has this guy. That guy. Okay, it's plasma energy. There it is. Um, uh, so in this case, I'm using, um, and I will. I, I should point out too, um, everything that I use in this project is available on the marketplace from Epic Content for free. Uh, everything that I used is from one of the Paragon character packs. So everything, I've, the meshes, the materials, everything, it's all already out there. I did alter the materials somewhat um, for my use case, but the base material is all uh, is all out there. So all I'm doing here is basically taking three, three different textures um, and offsetting it by just the fraction of a little bit, which will give you that chromatic aberration. Um, and then you can adjust the chromatic aberration. You can adjust the how, how far you offset it on what axis can sort of give you an idea of, of which direction the light is passing through something. Um, this is that way. And this is one way to do it. The corona actually has a built-in um, aberration in the texture. That's actually the wrong corona. <laughs> <laughs> one second. Very cool. Did you open? There it is. So this one has, uh, so you can see, this one has a built in. Um, it is actually using something Dan's going to talk about next. Um, but this is essentially a um, texture that's being driven by UVs to create that distortion around the edge. But the, the chromatic aberration is built into the texture itself. You're getting that blue to, to orangey fade through there. So hopefully that answers. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, even just seeing it just on the, the flat panel was so <laughs> beautiful. What the heck? Yeah, that's a it's it's also a key tip. Um, download any of the characters because there's a lot of great noise samples and effects textures that kind of come along with it that that you can really take and just do whatever do whatever you want with them there. Yeah, well, it's a great point. Absolutely, to use, you know, have some context to work with. I thought that was uh, beautiful, Eric. Yes, for sure. There was one last question I want to throw at you before we move sure. on to what Jan brought for us as well. Um, this one was about kind of just concepting, because as you stated, your effect is specifically supposed to work in tandem with the music that you've found as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're wondering, do you kind of storyboard that out beforehand, or do you just go with the flow and find what works best? Would I recommend storyboarding? Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> um, I, I, this one I sort of treated like what I would refer to as a sketch. So this was sort of like me free forming. Um, I knew going into it that I was going to do sphere. I, I was going to do object to object. I was going to do a transformation sort of object. Um, 
And I did, I spent, you know, this is one of those things when these challenges like this fail quick and fail fast. Um, I started out working on this. I was going to do the really cool thing. I was going to take the standard, uh, you know, UE mannequin that we've abused to death in, in these demos. And I was going to transform them into like one of the Paragon characters. And I was just going to have like, you know, basically the same idea as what I was showing here, but I was going to have the, the, the character animate up and all this other stuff. And I realized that I was spending so much time on animating the character's movement at the beginning. So I spent about two, two hours realized like I'm spending a lot of time on animating a character and this is not effects. This is, you know, I'm working on a game. It's really quick to, um, I have some wonderful people that work in our animation department that I can call up and be like, I need this animation. Uh, <laughs> we, we can get that done. Um, but this one I did definitely sketch this one out a little bit more. I would definitely recommend storyboarding it. Getting, um, I had a basic idea of what I wanted, um, but I, but I did not do it. And that caused me problems later on because I was trying to figure out, okay, what do I do here? things that I would have gone back and changed, like the magical energy that's sort of coming in there. I sort of left it the red and the blue because I think it's a good way of showing how you're, you can pull colors from other emitters to share, but I probably wouldn't have done that. I probably would have made them all gold or some variations of, of that color to sort of tie the whole effect together, uni unify the whole effect more. Um, so that's definitely, I would definitely recommend storyboarding, um, even if it's just in words. Like, I want this to happen, and then I want this to happen, and then I want, you know, for me, it would have been like, okay, sphere lifts up, sphere begins to spin, which if I had <clears throat> storyboarded that, I would have realized, ooh, I should start with a cube because you can't tell when the sphere is spinning. Uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time animating that sphere to spin, and I realized when I was starting to work on the effects, it's like, wow, you can't really tell that's spinning. Hopefully, <laughs> motion blur helped me a little there, but. Um, starting with a cube, you would have been, uh, you would have much more easily been able to see that spin. Um, so yeah, definitely storyboarding would be a way to do it. And just, you know, even if it's just in words, um, just sort of give yourself some points. Um, and then if you wanted to take it one step further before you started working on it, you could, you know, go find images of either effects or games or movies that you're like, this scene, this is what I'm trying to achieve when I say this. Um, so which doesn't mean you know copy that movie, but it does mean like the feeling and the timing and everything that, that's happening at this moment, that's what I want to achieve with what I'm doing. That's awesome. That's really good advice too, because I feel like um, similar at the end of that question, I probably would have been one of the people that just, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, having a plan before you're going in is really, really beneficial. But as you as you can see, Eric Eric did a great job, you know, sketching and stuff. And that's having some free form to it is really, really liberating because you're you're exploring most of the time that you're making effects. You're not immediately hitting a target. You're finding where you're finding the final uh, endpoint of that asset so that you can figure out like how it fits into the scene or how it fits into your game. Yeah, we'll often look yeah. for a great reference, lots of reference, lots of videos of things collapsing or falling over or strange phenomena in the real world. It's uh, It can become a little bit of an addicting rabbit hole. Yeah, and the, yeah you know, bioluminescent just... stuff on a beach. Yeah. yeah, I love when someone's always like, here's this building exploding in Syria. Great ref, you know, and you're like, oh, God, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, even, uh, even on Fortnite, we were always looking for reference like one of the things I uh, worked I just finished working on the, the new destruction that came out in chapter four. And one of the things I did for reference at the very beginning was I pulled Matt's work with his GPU destruction using Houdini. And that's sort of the starting point that I used as like, okay, this is something like we want to achieve. And then now how do I take that and translate it into to Fortnite? So even just, you know, looking at your peers work can sometimes sort of ping off ideas of like oh my god oh, Eric, I like I'm, that. I'm stealing that I'm... <laughs> i usually well, just dm, DM him and go, I, uh, give me that yeah it, <laughs> being being around um amazing artists like like you see here is uh it makes it easier so i mean community is everything right if you can find other people of similar passions um things go faster yeah game development is very rarely a one person sport or one person endeavor like there's there's always 
more to gain from collaborating or working with others or learning from others. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I also like the um, message that you had in there of fail early, <laughs> fail quick. Um, <laughs> and I do think that also goes hand in hand with, especially in challenges like this, don't get too attached to an idea to the point of like it, you know, taking away from the time that you have or trying to salvage something that just would probably work out better if you restarted or something along those lines. Yeah, that was the hardest, uh, as a, as a younger effects artist, that was the hardest. In fact, it's still the hardest thing for me to do is you work on something and you're like, oh, that's my baby. Um, <laughs> throw it out. <laughs> like you don't have to delete it. You can push it aside and say, okay, that may not work for this, but it's going to work for something else in the future. But definitely just be, just don't, don't feel bad when it doesn't work out. Um, it's really no. okay. <laughs> And also on, on Logic Productions, many like most assets. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, on Logic Productions, most assets pass through so many hands that it's not really one person's baby anyway, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it helps diffuse it a little bit. It's collective ownership. Well, and yeah, that Beautiful. failure, man. There's a lot of it's a lot of failure, but things only really have to work once, you know, which is the fascinating part, right? I mean, you can fail a hundred times, but if you get that one. Right, that's usually what matters. And that's usually what shifts in a game or a movie. It's, it's, it's a cool process to trust. I think it's just like I think over time, when you do when you do art, digital art, you learn to just trust in that process of failure. Like I'm gonna fail. I'm failing right now. Still failing. This still sucks. I still hate it. But that if you have this kind of like belief in the artistic process, you know that you will arrive at something pleasing mm -hmm. eventually just happens. It's strange. <laughs> You'll know it when you make it sort of thing. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you guys will, in the community, will all experience this as, as you're making is that um, it'll suck at first. And if you can just not give up um, the good, the good stuff's there. It's just behind that failure moment. It's just behind when you want to want to just call it and be like, I, I can't do this get this challenge that means you're close that means you're 40 percent of the way there then there's just 60 percent left to go and if you just keep going it'll work mm -hmm. yeah yep. absolutely great advice well thank you so much for walking us through that eric there was some oh, yeah. little tips in there that i am personally going to tuck away for myself to try out later so thank you for all of that um and then next up uh jan i want to be able to walk through the stuff that you've brought us today as well yeah, sure thing. Um, so I am not going to make an effect with you guys today. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit of the basics and fundamentals of how to um, create materials for effects. And so let me just turn on my screen share here real quick. All right. Can you maximize me, please? Thank you. All right. So I've prepared a little thing here, and uh, we are going to be making the material for this little effect here. It's like kind of ring, like a yeah, material animation that just pops out and then fades away. So it's nothing special. It's definitely not an effect itself, but it can be an element of an effect. And I hope that this will just give you some um, useful tools in the material editor um, that you might find useful. Um, and this is going to be. This is going to be very basic, so I'm not kind of telling you any cutting edge stuff. This is something that anyone can do, um, and hopefully anyone can learn. And if anything that I'm going to explain now is weird or confusing, please ask, because we can explain. It's uh, it's not that complicated, thankfully. So um, let's start with the um, Niagara system itself. So this is just a very, very simple burst. Um, I'm spawning one particle. It is, as you can see in the wireframe view, it is just one mesh. Let's make through okay. Um, two subdivisions and so on to avoid uh, stretching on the UVs, um, but it's a very, very simple um, setup. So I'm just bursting, and it lives for, I think, um, oh, sorry, here we go. It lives for five seconds, and um, then it just starts over. 
There are a few things in here that we might uh, get into later, like this mesh renderer, and here's my mesh and material override. We need to look at the mesh. Like I said, it is very, very simple. Just a ring with just very straightforward uh, UVs, which might be important. Just arranged in a square, filling out the entire 0 to 1. Uh, yeah, 0 to 1 square. All right. So um, I hope it's not going to take too long, but uh, I want to build this entire thing from scratch with you. So let's do that. We are going to make a new material. And uh, let's call this Aura Material. Okay. And let's go and assign that to our um, particle system so that we can see things as they happen. And right now, obviously, there's nothing. OK. Um, right, uh, before we go into here, let me really quickly talk to you about the assets that you see here. Uh, this is all um, these are all textures uh, and like the one mesh that I've created um, just yesterday. It's very limited. A few of these we're not even going to touch. The main texture we're going to be working with is a um, noise texture. I made this in Substance Designer. Um, it's um, I'm not sure if you um, if everyone has access to Substance Designer, but it's a very cool program for making noise textures, and it's a lot of fun to play with. Also, just to um, yeah, to relax, you know, making some fun procedural graphs. Um, and I will just really quickly show you the graph for this noise. It's uh, it's not that big, you know. Substance graphs can get pretty big. Uh, I'm basically just combining a bunch of uh, patterns and noises with warps and blurs and slope blurs and blends. And then in the end, we come to something that I then export as a grayscale texture. And something I also usually do is I also create a normal map from it. Um, we're not going to use this, but this is just a habit. So I normally um, do these both in a set with the same name so that I can refer to them later and just start like continue building my noise library, basically. Um, Right, but we're not going to go into this too deeply. You can also get a bunch of noise textures on the marketplace. Um, there's plenty of uh, packs around. I do want to just mention what is important to me about noise textures. First of all, they should tile. So they need to be seamlessly tiling textures to be able to make best use of them. And uh, the value range that they use, so the, the darkest and the brightest um, pixel in the texture should fill out the entire zero to one space. So the entire range from zero to 100% brightness. That way, um, a lot of the stuff that you do comes a lot easier. Um, otherwise, you have to compensate for it. And it's, it's just best to be avoided, best to be clean. And uh, I do like the zero to one space a lot. Uh, I try to do most operations in it. Um, and when we get to the math, we'll also see why. All right, let's close this and start building our material. So let's just drag the texture in here. Um, put that, let me maximize this here and maybe make this a little smaller. And let's just look at a nice little quad. So I'm going to make this an unlit material so that it's a little bit faster and additive. All right, so we have our texture. Doesn't do anything yet. It's boring. Let's pan it. We're going to add a panner. We've seen this a lot. Um, like I said, this is all very, very basic stuff. Um, and if you've already made VFX before, you're probably saying boring, move on. Um, but bear with me. As you can see, it just moves the texture up. That's a start, right? It's doing something. Um, very simple thing. I am going to skip over explaining how exactly it works internally, because you know that's not that interesting. Let's go and uh, put that on our mesh. So we're going to select our mesh and click on the little preview button down here. And that will show it on the mesh in the preview report. All right. So first of all, we want to tell it outward, not inward. So let's go negative speed. You also can see that this is kind of a little stretched doesn't look that great so let's go and 
I own the extra component a little bit more. So instead of um, so we could increase the the tiling on the the U, which in this mesh UVs is the the radial. Uh, sorry, the the circular axis. I keep getting those confused. So three times here, it's already looking a lot better. But I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to just stretch this one instead. So here we have one texture tiled around once. It's a start, right? So let's save this, look at it on our effect, and you can see, hey, it's doing stuff, but still have work to do. First of all, you can kind of see that this is just a tiling texture, even if it's kind of looking very interesting. So let's just add another panner to this. This is a very common way to just create some interesting looking dynamics and uh, Quickly, you're going to get to a point where that is uh, already enough, right? Let's just combine this here. All right, so right now, it doesn't look like much because they are both panning with the same speed. So let's add some variation here so that they diverge a little. You can see this already looks a little bit more interesting. But let's also make them make one go left a little bit. Make it one go right. Or whichever one is. Match. All right. You can see they were overlapping there a little bit. So I'm also going to scale them. I'm going to scale one of them only. So let's go with this one. In the coordinates and uh, just multiplying them by two. So that if you look at this texture alone, it is, you know, you can see it's kind of mirrored left and right. Um, it's just tiled twice around. And if I look at this one, you can see it's kind of a larger scale. I hope that makes sense. I hope this is coming through. Um, all right. So we have something that's a little bit more interesting, right? Um, what's next? Let us get rid of these hard edges here on the inside and the outside. Um, yeah, actually, before that, I want to talk really quickly about different ways to combine multiple textures, right? So I just used a multiply here, but that's only one of the ways uh, you can do this. And if you were uh, looking at this before, you can see like this one looks fairly dark, and the original looks a lot brighter. So multiply. Um, it basically it it pushes the value range uh, into uh, a lower area than just kind of blending them. So there are other ways to combine textures, and um, just real quick, I want to show four of them. Oh. So these are maybe not as interesting, but let's see. We have max, which just takes the higher value of the two. So you can see here, that's brightened up the effect a lot. And the brighter values are kind of overriding the darker values. Min is the opposite of that. So oh, there you go. It just takes the lower value of both. And then lerp which you've probably encountered before if you've ever touched the material editor, is just like blending with the alpha value being kind of the, the slider between one and the other. I'm going to go with this one for now. So this is just kind of 50% of one, 50% of the other. All right. Cool. We have something that looks a little bit more interesting. Let's go and look at it in our effect. Yeah, getting there. All right. Now, like I said, let's get rid of the edges. So we are going to start using math. And I want to stress here that math is your friend. Math is not the enemy. Math can be scary, but it means well. So um, let's uh, just disconnect this for now and see how we can get a nice little gradient on our, um, on our mesh. 
So we use this one here. And you can see it's dark at the center and bright at the outside. So we're kind of fading from zero to one, going uh, starting at zero in the middle and going to uh, one at the outside. Um, we kind of want the opposite, right? So we are going to invert that. We are going to use the one minus node, which is just taking the input, in this case our gradient, and subtracting it from one. And just to show you that math is not scary, I'm just going to show you what that means. It's just reversed. And so the one minus node basically flips the zero to one space. You can see why I mentioned the zero to one space is also your friend. So we are taking the zero that was here at the center and uh, subtracting it from one. And if you subtract zero from something, nothing happens. So wait, so it stays one. So the zero becomes a one and here it's the other way around. The one becomes a zero. All right, simple enough. Cool, but we also want a fade in the center to get rid of this edge here. So let's, um, yeah, let's combine them. And this time we're actually going to do it with a multiply. All right. Let's do it like this. But that's a bit donut shaped. So we are now going to modify just, hang on, just this range here. We want to kind of tighten it up so the gradient is closer to the inner edge. And um, it just gives us a very, very small fade. So I have prepared something for that. And uh, please stop me if that's taking too long or if it's going to be um, yeah, too, too deep into that. But um, here we have a material that I've prepared where I want to show you linear remapping. So this is just an example graph, right? We have here the same um, gradient that we had in our other material. Let's um, just pass into this lerp, and I just want to show you real quick what this does. This is just a vertical divider, black at the bottom, white at the top, which means that we are going to see our A input at the bottom and our B input at the top. So right now, this graph is kind of neutral and doesn't do anything. But if I change a value here, like the bias, you can see that this starts changing. All right. um, I've actually made a material instance for this so that we can see a bit better how the, um, how the parameters affect the result. So here, you can scrub the bias, and it moves the zero point, which is this one, which was originally here, it moves that back and forth. All right, the scale, as you can see here, it just multiplies the result that makes the gradient steeper or shallower. So if I reset that to zero, you can just see it's darker or brighter. That's one way to think about it. But uh, another way to think about it is that it takes this range, the zero to one range that we have here and stretches or squashes it. So if I set this to two, our, um, let me zoom in a little bit here, okay. Um, this was a zero point before, and it's still a zero point. This was a one before, but by scaling it to two, our one point has moved to the middle, because this is now two. I hope that makes sense. I am going to just really quickly sketch this out in Photoshop. I hope it's not redundant. Uh, but Back. So here we go. Okay. So what happened here is that we had our zero to one range and we have multiplied it by two, which means that, and I find it always easiest to think about these ranges um, in uh, terms of their extremes. So the one end and the other end. And uh, if I multiply a range with something, what happens to it? is easiest to visualize if you think about what happens to its two ends. So we have here 0 times 2 equals 0. So this is still 0. And here we have 1 times 2 equals 2. So this is now 2. 
This is very fundamental, very basic, I know. But this is an easy way to think about it. Um, same way with the bias that we applied before, which was just adding a value to, um, to our range. We had, for example, if we um, subtract 0 0.5, we have here 0 minus 0 0.5 equals, oh, this is a 5, I swear, negative 0 0.5. That's a 5, OK? And over here, we have 1 minus 0 0.5 equals 0 0.5 positive. So that means we have changed, and let me just switch back to the other screen so that it's easier to visualize. One sec, there you go. Um, we have changed the zero points location by subtracting 0 0.5 to be in the middle. It's here before, and by subtracting 0 0.5 or adding minus 0 0.5, which is the same, we've just moved it to where the 0 0.5 point was before. OK, I think uh, that's enough of that. This is basically just to, to show you how you can manipulate uh, gradients and ranges like that. And the interesting thing is that doesn't just work for gradients. That works for textures as well. So I can just take this and plug this into the same graph that I had before. I need to apply though. And then you can see here how we are modifying the dark and bright ends of our range, which just in this case happens to be no longer linearly distributed, but in a weird pattern, a weird noise pattern. So let's see, we can make it brighter, we can make it darker, or we can scale it up. You know, it's the same, very elemental um, operations, but I'm not lying when I say that this is like 80, 90% of what I do with textures all the time. It's just uh, useful to understand so that you can kind of um, do with it what you need to, when you need to. All right. Um, yeah, let's, let's go back to our material though. All right. So we have here our linear gradient and we want this to be steeper. So what we're going to do is we are going to first scale it. Let's say by a factor of 20. And uh, oh. you can see now the gradient looks a lot smaller. Like the, the dark part is it's much smaller, but it's glowing on the outside, which is not what we want. But it makes sense when you think about it, because this was 1 before, and we multiplied by 20. So now it's 20, which is far too bright. So instead, we're going to clamp it. Uh, saturate is the same as a clamp. Hang up to the zero to one range. So this is um, just kind of restricts the values to the zero to one range, which means that if a value is higher than one, it gets snapped to one. And if it's lower than uh, zero, it gets snapped to zero. Very useful, uses all the time. And these things are basically free. All right. So now we have our inner gradient here. After a long, laborious process and explanation for me, I'm sorry. Um, now let's also combine it with our outer gradient. There we go, like that. And we have something that probably works. I do want to kind of tighten up the, um, the outer gradient, though. So I'm going to use a power node here. Just, um, you know, base and exponent. Hopefully you remember this from school. And you see we get a much softer fall off to the outside. All right, so that's our gradient. Uh, let's apply this to our texture by simply multiplying it. Well, stay here. Here we go. OK. There we go. And now we have our panning texture nicely fading out, fading in from the center and fading out towards the edge. So let's apply this and look at it in our particle system. Here you go. Still grayscale, but we'll get to that at the end. You can see it's getting closer. No, not really this one up. Okay. All right. Uh, how's this so far? Do we have any questions yet that I could or should jump into before we move on? Or everything? I mean, I have a no. question. Go ahead. Please. I do. Um, would you use a clamp to just clamp out your zero value and say you still want it to go brighter when you're doing your remap? Or would you do a different technique for that? 
So you, you just want to use a max for that, actually. Ah, okay. So um, this is uh, like you know one of the two nodes I showed before, like a max here. Um, and we can say take our value. Like um, I mean, in this case, it, like it doesn't make sense because the negative values are not on the mesh, basically. But if you say uh, I want to go positive, but I want to not go negative, you do a max with zero. Because that means that if the B value is lower than zero, it will use zero because zero is higher. And this I always mix this up when I use them because max sounds like I want a large value, right? But it's the opposite. I think you just cleared up that so. node for me completely. So. <laughs> ah, OK. Awesome. All right. OK, what's next? Let me look at my notes real quick. Next up, we are going to do something that VFX artists use a lot, which is add UV distortion. Um, like I said, we have a pattern here that's also already kind of looking interesting and dynamic. And for many effects, that will be good enough. I want to give it a little bit more. Um, I want to hide that it's just two tiling textures, you know. So I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated, as tech artists are tend to do. <laughs> so UV distortion means what we're doing is we're applying some distortion to the coordinates that we're using to sample our other textures, and um, if you look at the texture coordinate node as it is, you can see this is just a flat gradient going around and going from the inside to the outside. So this is um, kind of a continuous space, right? We want to distort that. You want to just mess it up a little. So let me just make some space here. Because what we're going to do happens before we sample the texture so that we can change where the texture is sampled from. All right, uh, OK. Now let us grab another texture that I made before. And you know I have a normal map for this as well, but I want to use this one because it's softer and gives a nicer result. So let's just take this. And then we have a normal map. Um, this one um, good to know thing here is that you can do UV distortion with normal maps as well as with regular noise textures. But I'm going to use a normal map because it's easier. Because uh, generally, if it's generated in the same way, the, um, the effect of it will be a little smoother and kind of more congruous. Um, I, I can show you the difference later. So let's just go and let's we only want two channels because UVs are only U and V. So we have two channels. And we only want our red and green vector from the normal map. Because as you know, like if the normal is uh, constructed in a, like if it's a tangent space normal, then the blue vector just points up. So we only want kind of the vectors that point uh, forward and to the side. And now we are going to bias our coordinates. Here you go. And let's see what that looks like. You can see this is already pretty messed up. Uh, and it is, I'm going to spoiler this, it is going to be too messed up. So I'm going to turn that down by scaling it. <laughs> You can see, this is the same thing um, I used before on the simple gradient, just uh, applied in a different way. Like, literally, 90% of material stuff is uh, going to be modifying 0 to 1 ranges. Oh, here's another trick, by the way. You can set slider min and max on uh, scale up parameters, which is very useful if you want to just wiggle values and see what happens. You do have to click away and select it again in order for that to be active. So now I can just slide it between 0 and 1. Because otherwise, if you don't set a max, so like the min and max are identical, then you will just quickly get into very, very large values. And it's difficult to kind of uh, get somewhere where you uh, have values that are useful to you. And you can see here, like if I add this, you can see kind of a little bit of subtle changes in the gradient. It's not that great to see. Um, if I add a little bit higher value here, it's a bit better to see, but it's still going to be um, very noticeable when we sample the texture, which let's just remove the preview and look at that. There you go. OK, you can see here, this looks very refracted and watery, right? And that's the effect of this normal map here. Um, I do want to add some more dynamics to this, though. So I'm also going to add a panel here. Also animate this texture. And let's just go minus, I don't know, Zero point. Yeah. 
magic number. All right. Uh, I don't quite like yet how this pattern looks, so I'm going to increase the tiling of this. Again, just like we did here, multiplying the coordinates after panning. Um, you could also multiply the coordinates before the panner, but uh, I like to do it afterwards because that means that I can set the speed and it sort of stays the same speed. If I uh, would scale the coordinates before I put them into the panner, then I would have to also scale the speed in order to match. So it's, um, it's just a convenience and ease of use thing. So you say this is already a little bit nicer, right? OK. All right. Let's uh, set this a bit lower because we don't want it to be that obvious and just kind of subtle. Here you go. A nicely distorted, weird little energy dispersion thing. All right. That is UV distortion in a nutshell. Um, let's just quickly, like I promised, show you what that looks like if we use a non-normal map. Like here I have a texture that's just two different uh, noise maps in the red and green channel. So like if uh, you look at the red channel, it's just a grunge like this. And if you look at the green channel, it's a grunge in the other direction, slightly blurred. It's just, you know, random noise textures that have also generated Substance Designer. Uh, we don't need this anymore. All right. So the difference between using a regular texture and using a normal map is that the output that you get from the RGB output and from the, from the sampler in general is going to be in a different range. And again, we're talking about ranges, right? So in a texture, uh, in a normal sampler, um, what comes out of here is within the minus one to one range. So the values can be anywhere from minus one to one with uh, zero being like obviously the neutral center. Um, but with a regular texture, um, normally, unless it's an HDR texture, but let's not talk about that, um, you get values out of here that are in the um, zero to one range. So I'm just going to switch back to a quad uh, for illustration purposes again real quick. So if we just look at our blended textures here, okay. And if I just plug this in naively, Uh, nope, that's actually not helpful. OK, oh, sorry. So um, if you do a static kind of um, UV distortion like this, this is fine. It can probably work. But just be aware that we're pushing the values. We're basically pushing the coordinates only into one direction and not in two different directions. Like with the normal map, if we use that instead, um, the values get uh, like, for example, push to the left and to the right, depending on which way the normal vector is facing, or up and down, or whatever. But uh, with this texture, the values would only get pushed uh, in one direction. And this is something that I see sometimes when people use refraction or, or distortion, that their um, effects seem to be trending towards one corner or one side, and so on. That's usually what happens when your range is not centered correctly. So let's do that real quick. We know this is in the 0 to 1 range. We know this is in the minus 1 to 1 range. We know we want it in the minus 1 to 1 range. So we are going to do what we already did before, All right. adding a bias of negative 0 0.5. That shifts our value range from 0 to 1 into the minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. And then we're just multiplying it by 2. And now we have a minus 1 to 1 range. Put that in there and it will be better centered. Again, though, I think this texture is probably not a good example for this because you can't really see it. Just be aware. Um, there's also another node that does this kind of in one go, which is also very common, and that you will find a lot in um, published materials and so on. That's the constant bias scale node. That's also where the names come from, right? That has a bias and a scale, and it does the exact same thing. It applies a bias first, and then it scales. So here you can just do this in one just doesn't have any input, so you can't expose it as parameters. There you go. And that does the same. This and this. Do the same thing. All right. This will not be on the test. OK. We have our UV distortion, and it looks OK. Now, 
Let's go back to our mesh, actually. Oh, here we go. Right, that excursion. Um, any questions so far before we move on? Uh, no, I think everybody right now is just mesmerized. Uh, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> All right. Good cool. morning. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on to the next step. And that is, uh, if you remember what I had here before, um, I'm just going to show it again, what it looked like before. Uh, at the end, we kind of have this fading away, but not just kind of by fading out, but by sort of um, eroding, right? And that's another effect that you will find a lot in the effects materials, and that's just erosion, value erosion. Let's go back and use our work in progress material. And again, the way to do this is by modifying a range. I know, I'm repeating myself. So here we are just going to subtract value. Oh, if we subtract one, obviously it's not going to be anything anymore. So let's just uh, plug in a debug function here, which is very useful. And that's debug time sign and time sign, which just kind of, if you preview this, you can see it, it just sort of pendulums between zero and one back and forth. So if you want to test like what does a, a value do, um, you can just use this for that. That's very convenient. So here, let's see what happens if we just subtract. And you can see it's nicely dithering away. I mean, it's fading, but it's also, yeah, just eroding. And that's good enough for us. You can do a lot more with this. And uh, just yesterday, I think, saw a, a good tweet about this um, by uh, to our tower games. Uh, but for us, this is good enough. Let's not go too deep into this. All right, that's our erosion. But we do obviously want to not drive this by a time sign. We want to drive this from the Niagara system. So let's go back here. And I've already prepared something here. I have a dynamic material parameter set and protocol update. This is very easy to add. You just go plus and um, set in your testing parameter directly. And that gives you an empty set parameters node. And then here you can, oh, module, not node, sorry. I'm in node land. And here you can then assign a dynamic material parameter. And there's four of these, but um, we only care about one because we only want to pass one scalar value. Um, I'm just going to remake what I did here just so you can see how it's done. Um, we are only caring about one scalar value. So let's make a float for uh, from four different floats. And then we're just taking this one, driving it from a curve. And then we can say, okay, uh, let me just disable this so that you can see what it does. Yeah, it is going to, if I'm not mistaken, start eroding. Nope, that didn't work. What am I missing? Uh, Sorry, I think I that material keep... doesn't have a dynamic parameter set up in it yet. Oh, yes, you're absolutely right. The other one does. Okay, sorry. Right, so in the material, we add a dynamic parameter node. And it looks like this. By the way, if a node is red, that means it's an input that gets passed into the shader. Um, just useful to know that this is something that uh, comes from somewhere else. Um, for example, the texture coordinates that you see here, they come from the mesh or from wherever you're getting them from, but usually from the mesh that the material is rendered on. And this dynamic parameter is going to come from Niagara. Let's give it a name, call this erosion, and set a default. Uh, I don't want it to be eroded because then I can't see anything anymore in the material. So I'm going to set the default of this channel to zero. And there is our effect. OK, all right. And now you can see we are sort of reverse eroding, which is not what we want. Um, so let's flip this around. I mean, actually, you, you know how the curves work. I'm just going to delete this and just use the one that I already have. There you go. So this is set up for the curve to start at uh, 0.6 normalized time, and then just kind of softly fade from 0 to 1. And now you see we have in our effect already something that looks like what we had before. So there is only one thing missing, color. All right, let's take all of this. By the way, it's a very good practice to uh, comment your graphs, not just for other people on your team, but also for yourself in the future. <laughs> so I'm going to just do that real quick and 
call this distortion. And this is I would our... also add, if you're utilizing the new declared reroute system, comments are extremely important. Otherwise, you're just going to yes. send people on wild goose chases through your entire graph. Yeah, yeah. there's all something you can do. Yeah, I'm not, not going to go into that because it's I think it's a rabbit hole. Um, here is our reversion. Okay, enough. Let's actually saturate this at the end so that we are staying within the zero to one range. Well, now let's color this. There are many different ways to add color to um, a grayscale range or effect or whatever. So the simplest and most straightforward that I see a lot is just to tint it. Tinting means we multiply it with a color. So let's just create a color parameter. By the way, I did that by holding down V for vector parameter and clicking in the graph. And we'll just create a note for you. The same shortcuts exist for many other um, uh, nodes as well. So it's uh, useful when you don't want to right click and search for stuff all the time. So um, you can find those in the editor preferences, and you can also change them if you want. So here we go. We have a red that looks very flat. I can spruce it up a little bit by kind of uh, going a little bit more into the orange and maybe, oh, yeah, OK. And maybe adding a little bit more brightness here. That's OK. But it's still, it's just monochrome, right? This is, uh, we're getting a little bit of um, brightness from the, the tone mapper, actually, which is uh, pushing over bright values. Um, into a little desaturated white. That's uh, what it's supposed to do. But we don't really have a lot of control over this, and it still is going to look pretty flat. Uh, still, for a lot of things, this is good enough. Right? Another thing you can do, which is uh, which I also see a lot, is just to take two colors. Let's just uh, create, I don't know. Let's do, just for illustration purposes, do a blue and a yellow. I hope that's not a colorblind combination that someone isn't going to be able to see. Oh, that is way too bright because this one is way too bright. So let's just turn that back down to one. The value is the brightness. So here we go. This is not helpful because it's way too bright. And there we go. So we have not a very pretty gradient. This is a bad example because you can make this look better, but still it's going to be limited to being kind of too colors and still going to look pretty flat. Um, we're going to make it unflat soon, but uh, first I want to show you how you can pass colors in from the particle system. And uh, I've prepared this here with the scale color node, which is going to just fade from red to yellow over the life of the particle system. And you can access that in the material by doing the particle color input. So let's just do this, put that in there. And here we're not going to see anything because this is just the material preview window um, and the default is white. So let's apply. And in our effect, we can see it starts red and then fades to yellow over time. Just useful for many things. Like for example, if you have more than one particle and you want them to kind of fade as they age or something like that. So it's very useful for that. But for in this particular case, uh, it's just giving us one uniform color. I just wanted to show how you can put that into your materials. All right. Um, we want more interesting gradients. So we are going to use a nifty little feature called a curve atlas. You can also use a gradient texture, but I've had a lot of trouble kind of getting those to look correct. So it's easier for me to um, iterate directly in the engine. So we're creating a curve atlas row parameter is what it's called. I'm going to just call this one gradient map. The, like this, just to remind you, this is our um, zero to one range effect. I plug this in here. And then I have to apply a curve atlas and a curve. So I have prepared one. I'm not going to show you how to do them because there's already live streams about that, I think. I have a few gradients prepared. Um, this one is a very simple linear black to white gradient. So if we use that, there is no change for this. 
so nothing changes. It is still going to be, oh, if I stop the preview, you can also see it. Oh, and what happened? Uh, I think I made a mistake. Yes, okay. Um, you see here the error. <laughs> and as uh, Matt already said, a lot of the time you spent debugging. Um, thankfully, I already know uh, what the problem is. So here it says, cannot cast from larger type float4 to smaller type float2. And that means that what comes in here is a float4. Uh, that is a vector with four components, so a four-dimensional vector. Um, but it's expecting, a, I guess, a float1 or a float2. So here exactly is where the problem is. We are taking the RGB output of our texture samples when we only really want a grayscale output. So let's just grab those pins by control clicking, plug them into the R instead of the RGB, and there we go. Now the error is gone and everything is fine again and we're happy. Cool. So, oh yeah, by the way, you can on most nodes you can click on this little icon to show a preview and if you uh, enable real-time nodes and no previews and so on, you can it can help kind of debug what's happening in your graph. But now the interesting thing is adding color. So let's look at the gradients that we have prepared here. So I've already created a blue one, and it is pretty dark. But this is just a gradient that starts kind of in like a purplish blue and then goes through a teal into white. That's a little bit more interesting than just a flat uh, black to blue gradient, right? So let's see that. But as I said, it's a bit dark. So let's multiply it with a brightness. So make it a parameter. And a scalar parameter by holding down S and clicking, by the way. Also very common, very often used. There we go. So that's a little bit better. Better to see, easy to see. But let's use the gradient that we actually used on our original effect. There you go. I think it may be a little bit brighter. But now, you're getting somewhere, right? Still going to look a little bit different because we've used different tiling values and so on, but I think we are close. So that is what you can do with materials. I'm going to show you one final thing. Uh, let's just swap it out again to just uh, see how it compares. Our original one. This is the original. And this is the one we just made together. So one more thing, because it's still it's a little bit punchier than just having a flat gradient, but I'm not that happy with it yet. So I'm just going to go and take all of this. Let's just delete this. There we go. And duplicate it by pressing Control D. And I'm going to change the tiling values a tiny little bit. Let's see. And here. Yeah, not quite. There we go. Okay. And then we are going to give this the other gradient and simply add them together with an add node. Oh, sorry, this is using the same parameter. So if I change one, then both of them change. So let's rename this parameter. You can do it here by clicking here or just um, hitting F2 while you have the node selected. So, two. so let's change this one back to the gold gradient or fire gradient. And look at that. I'm very happy with myself because this looks nice. Here we go. Pretty. And here's our effect in action. Well, yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much what I've prepared. Um, any questions? Anything uh, you want me to retroactively go less into or more? <laughs> let me know. <laughs> no, this was this was fantastic. I. Honestly, there actually weren't a lot of questions being asked. And I think part of that was because it was very easy to follow. Um, however, there were quite a few comments of people talking about how you're comparatively like the Bob Ross of materials and with the <laughs> yeah, so relaxed the entire time. Yeah. So this is my happy place. So 
<laughs> I, I play a lot with materials just for fun. So um, solving some, um, okay, again, I think you can go back to the full view. Yeah. Uh, okay. Solving material puzzles for fun is uh, very relaxing for me. And uh, yeah. there's so many puzzles, like just how can I solve this in a material? How can I make it do exactly what I want? How can I make things pretty with math? So yes. And it if was you have any, <laughs> any questions about materials or how to do stuff in the material editor, feel free to, uh, yeah, reach out to me. I think you yeah, had my Twitter up before or wherever you find me. Awesome. Yeah. We'll definitely make those come up again, uh, later in the show. And yeah, if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to you on. Um, now before we continue, I know Matt, you are a very busy man. <laughs> so, um, if you need to um, step out, that is completely fine. We are muted. Oh, muted. I cannot hear you. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> We're in suspense. I think he's frozen. Oh no, did we lose Matt? Oh no. Oh no. Well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So thank you so much, Matt, for coming on and giving us your talk and all that. Very much appreciate your time. Um, hey. Wait, he might. We might have him back. There we go. <laughs> I'm back. There. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself and left the call. But uh, I do have to run. <laughs> but it was uh, it was awesome to to get to watch all these talented people do their magic, and I can't wait to see the community's magic and what they come up with. Absolutely. So, Thank you so much for, me, for coming. And, in. Uh, I'll see you guys around. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. See you again, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, first. Um, Fantastic walkthrough on that was there were so many things in there that I learned and there's a lot of those very small simple nodes that I feel like even tiny bits of that I take for granted or didn't fully understand even using them several times. So getting that walkthrough with fresh perspective was very helpful and I know that's also that's going awesome. to be very useful for a lot of the viewers who are um, going to be using that for the challenge as well. And when you have the chance, because the comments are always saved, the chat is always saved with the VODs and they're posted afterwards, you should scroll through and see. You you had quite a fan base right. while that was going on. Oh, God. Not again. <laughs> again? <laughs> awesome. Thanks, all. <laughs> So next up, um, Juan, do you want to show us the stuff that you brought as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll get on to that. Yeah, I'm going to be, since we've obviously had a bunch of effects artists really showing off some really cool stuff, I'm going to sort of focus more on how to get some good output from, from Unreal in terms of movie render queue and in sequencer, just to sort of um, work on that kind of stuff. Uh, here we have a fairly simple scene. I chose uh, Undertow Gideon um, for for fun, just because Skull Guy. I like cool Skull Guys. So we'll have this uh, we'll have this sequence that I have set up. Before I get into that, um, real quick, if you're using the clapper up here and you don't have your sequence available, that just means you need to have a placed version of your sequence dropped into your level. Otherwise, it won't show up in there. And you can place multiple, and then you can sort of have it listed if you want in there. Um, it's just a little, little tip to have there for sequencer. And then another important tip, especially if you're running really, uh, really low frame rate, is that if you right click, you go down. Where is it? Where? Is, oh, here we go. Uh, thumbnail. Stop drawing thumbnails because. Uh, you don't really need thumbnails for your camera right there unless you're really focusing on what your cameras are doing from shot to shot in that track. Um, another one that I have is you notice that my sequencer is rather small. Sometimes you'll have to end up going like that or scrolling through. Um, one of the things that I that I almost, I've already done it here like virtually, is that I pin my camera cut track, which um, 
allows you to scroll through, but then keeps your camera cut track here, so you can kind of hop in and out really quickly. Uh, all, although, also, I learned that I believe it's Shift C. Yeah, Shift C pop you in and out of your director track as well. But I use that because I'm always in here clicking on different things. Uh, in here, you'll see that I have a. I'll actually increase this. Um, you'll see that I have the camera and a couple of different elements. Um, I didn't do everything inside of the Niagara system, but this is more of a showcase of just some elements that you can play within Sequencer versus in Niagara. Because um, you can do a lot of your, you can do a lot of interplay between your timing in Niagara and in Sequencer very quickly, and you can iterate that way. And since we're kind of doing rendered output, there's a lot you can kind of get away with in that situation. So we have this, and his hands set on fire. There's some cool effects going around on them, but there's some there's some errors here and there that you can cut you can't notice like right off the bat too much, but um one of the tools that I use to sort of find out exactly what my particles are doing is this life cycle track. And if you've worked in sequencer and 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 done Niagara stuff before, uh this will be very familiar to you. But um this life cycle track it allows you to trigger your Niagara system once and then you can see its full range. You can see how much of it is uh, where when it's playing, and you and it's a little bit more robust than say the um, let's see the effects component, uh, the system tra toggle track where you can enable, disable, and turn on and off sequences. But what's what's the power in here, and you can already see it on my screen, is that if you go down to the age update mode, it starts in default by tick delta time, so it it looks exactly like you you would just trigger something. But if you set it to desired age, um, we now sort of have the ability to to step through in sequencer, and you can and you can just step forward through your entire simulation, and you can see what it's it, what it's doing per each. Uh, if you step back, it will re-simulate to that point. And if you do that a few times, you'll notice if I go forward and back, it's not hap it's not appearing in the same spot. Um, and if we're rendering something and we're not in a real-time environment, uh, sometimes you'll get issues where you're like, oh, that looks bad in this frame, versus, oh, that's just one bad seed or something like that. Uh, one of the ways that uh, you can sort of navigate this is to set your set determinism on your Niagara system here. So um, let's break down this element a little bit more. I use the, if you go to the Niagara content examples and in the advanced section, there's a system called the Skeletal Mesh Reproduction. It does all this sort of cool um, uh, sampling of your skeletal mesh and then has these pieces f attract and, and move away from the character. And that's sort of what I was using here. But everything is sort of built in there to be organic and sort of not be the same every time. So I go in and I set determinism on these elements over here. We, we go back to our, our system right here. You'll be able to start seeing a lot of these elements, you know, they will come back to the exact same point that they were before. Uh, and you won't have any, so you will know exactly where your particles are per each frame of this. And this, this is more specifically for linear content effects in this in this uh, sort of respect. Uh, and then if you notice, there's a bit of weirdness happening in here. So I'm going to, there's, there's a moment where in the initialization of this entire element, you can kind of see it there where every liquor's on, and then you start seeing particles come away. So I'm do a cheat. Where you can just use a keyframe track to set visibility on your uh, on your on your entire system. Oops, I want to do here at the frame that you need it for. So then, if it's just invisible and you're and you're running a simulation on it, you won't actually see those elements until it starts to spawn them in the spot that you need them to. So that can be sort of a way, kind of quick and dirty in this respect, but it's a way to sneak away from cer certain times when there will be a frame that's really bad uh, at the start, or or if you need to initialize something. Um, really, and it has to be sequencer driven. So that's a really quick 
little element to that. Um, but mainly when you're working in sequencer, you really want to sort of use these life cycle these life cycle tracks for when you're really trying to craft that element. Because we can go in here and say, let's bring this back up. Um, these influencers are controlling the amount of um, the, the the amount of force into this area. So if I increase this, we simulate change based on those new values, and you'll be able to see um, whatever whatever changes you have you're having happen at that point. Uh, one of the other things you can do is that say you want to keep all your values the same, but you just don't like what it's doing right now. Well, right underneath determinism, let me just open this up a little bit more. There's uh, the random seed, which you can use to initialize at a, at a different point for all of your sort of randomized variables. And even further, you can go into any of your, any of your elements and sort of pull down this show advanced, um, and you'll start seeing stuff like randomness mode and simulation defaults. Uh, this, this sort of advanced section makes it so that any of your randomized variables, you can discreetly change their seed without affecting the rest of the entire uh, system in that way. So you can get really, really nitty gritty into that if you're if you're tweaking everything. But in general, it's good to know that you can just change your seed and sort of stick to it and know that you're going to get the same uh, output from there. So we'll just shrink this down for a little bit. And, and now, so we have something they were happy with what with, with where this is going right now. Um, and we want to get a render out. So what we have, and that's actually a tab. So um, if you go into cinematics and movie render queue, um, that's where you'll get this tab here. Now, if you don't see that when you're, when this is, when you go over to the cinematics tab, you'll need to go to your, your plugins folder or your plugins uh, browser, and then just search for movie render and you'll see there it by default in clean on real builds off so you'll want to um so you want to just enable that and do a restart uh so, so and um quickly we can just sort of go to our content browser here um and we can just drag and drop this sequence in here and once it's it's in there, you've got sort of a so uh, a default setup that you can start working with, um, and this unsaved config is where you can start uh, so, sort of getting all of your settings in there. Uh, I generally don't recommend it. Uh, I would go with a PNG sequence. That way you you have a little bit uh, more range on there. There's there's plenty more ways to get output out of this, but I'm going to just focus on PNG since that's the one that I normally use as often. Um, there's only one option in here, and that's write alpha. And this can trip you up if you're using any kind of specific uh, material post-process effects that say that are not necessarily, or that are writing out their own alpha value. If you have this, that your, your post-process material might end up having your renders show up black. All black frames, when you come um, movie render, and you're using a PNG sequence. Just, just try this checkbox. And this, this might be just a tutorial about where checkboxes are that'll cause you problems. <laughs> um, so we have, so we have this, so we have this setup that's all sort of default except for the PNG sequence, and then um, you have deferred rendering added in here. There's not too many things you'll want to mess around with. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go through each section because this that could take quite a long time, but just sort of just sort of know that this is a fairly standard uh, setup get from here. So, in your output directory, I definitely recommend changing a lot of this. And there's a couple of helpful little here. There are curly brackets that are used to set up um, these values and or set up these different folders. So you can automate a couple of different uh, setups so that you can do rapid iteration styles in here so i'm gonna go and i'm just gonna see kind of e so i'll just pick this folder right here i'll select that folder 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a backslash curly bracket 8. And that'll give us an automatic folder of whatever date that we've decided to render, and, and it'll start spewing all, all the, the frames out into that. Um, but say I want to keep a record of what previous iterations have done. Um, I'll do another curly bracket, and I'll type in version. And, uh, and that sort of gives you a nice little workflow that you, can, that you can play around with. I've already done that just to make sure that I was doing it right. Uh, and I've, I've gotten output from here. There's a little bit of a weirdness where it'll give you versions the first time, but it won't do that. And especially if that folder has different versions in it, it'll just iterate through the next value. And here you can see I have all the frames. All the frame data is, is now stored in here. And we can just pull that up and say I have it here in, in Shockrid or Shotgun. And you can see now we have our now we have our frames that we can go to. And since and since we have this now set in our queue, uh, set this cancel or uh, I would save that there generally. But um, now that we have this in our queue, we can just render straight from straight from here when it's happy with where we did. So you can just button, you get new frames of whatever content. And it's a very nice workflow to if you if it's not taking too long that you can rapidly iterate and just see exactly what your output is. Um, and if you hit this little drop down, you can or sorry, if you're if you're in here, you can load and save your presets uh, via via this little this little button over here. And then once you're happy with your queue, you can save it over here. Now I've already built a queue, so we'll just pop that open and you'll see I have a preset. It's the pretty much the same standard. Uh, and, and then date and version and everything is all sort of working in that sense. And that's really and that that'll really get you started to be able to use uh, move your render queue to, to sort of get frame output from here. Now for what, MP4s and such, I would um, recommend going to the um, dev community portal. Uh, Sean Comley did a uh, really extensive uh, article on how to use the command line encoder. And uh, for Fortnite cinematics, we also do the same thing where we, we have FFmpeg installed and we we use the command line encoder. And once all of our frames are, are, are rendered out, it then takes all of that and com uh, compresses it into a .mp4 or whatever codex you want to use. And, and using this, uh, this sort of step-by-step setup will get you to be able to get a .mp4. I warn you, this is fairly like power user kind of stuff. It involves um, just sort of going around getting FFmpeg installed and using command uh, command lines and command prompts to get some stuff. So it can be tricky, but it's, in it's incredibly valuable to just have the movie ready to go. So I highly recommend trying that out. Uh, any questions so far from anybody? Uh, no, so far. We're we're looking good. They're following along. Yeah. So so we have this all so we have this all set up and we can let's just hit we can do a hit of render here because once let's you hope have we don't you. hopefully not. At it's is it still going good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now we have a very nice slideshow of what we're rendering. Um <laughs> and you can sort of see your render preview and you can immediately see and if it's rendering, you you'll notice that your play and your stop buttons on your on your top bar are working uh, are working for it. So if you do hit that and say you forgot something or if they are in black and you do need to fix something, you can immediately hit the stop button and that'll cancel the render path and close down that that uh that that window that's giving you the render preview, you can get back to working in your in your system that way. Uh, let's see. Those are most of the tips that I have for this. Um, I can go a bit more into uh, sort of the set the the setup of this in that um, the initialized mesh reproduction uh, and and update mesh sort of um, modules in Niagara. Are, are a little bit more advanced than, say, skeletal mesh location, in the sense that these 
these uh these modules uh sort of collect each each uh, vert or each triangle that's that's on your mesh and then tries to make a sprite that meets the size or the area of that triangle and and match it up you can you can sort of get into this more and fully recreate the mesh like uh, uh like vert per vert but but for the most part this is just fairly simple uh sprites kind of taste on the normal angle and it's a very it's it's a very robust tool and i very recommend using it especially if you want to do a lot of cool dissolving effects on characters i've used this quite a few times for uh various different effects um let's see oh, oh yeah 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 so um there's another thing that that uh, uh go into slightly with sequencer is the differences between spawnables and and possessables uh right now i've done everything in here as possessables but niagara systems are are fairly especially if you have multiple shots are fairly are fairly good at um being used as spawnables in the sense that they will be destroyed directly after um, your shot is done or when you decide to uh, uh, set this spawned variable to false. Um, I'm using it only here because that's another tool that you can sort of, uh, that's another valuable use case of it, is that most of your actors won't exist in the world more than for what you need them for, which is to take that shot. So. Um, Having them and having your Niagara systems as spawnable means that, especially in a collaborative environment, you're not necessarily keeping the keeping some of these assets like alive or or maybe even simulating uh, when you're in other shots and you're not looking directly at them. So it's a it's another sort of precaution that you can do in terms of, and especially if like you don't have necessarily like view distance or scalability set up on it, and you can just sort of cut this off and be like, I don't want this to be more anymore. If you do despawn something and then respawn it, though, um, it will, depending on your auto-activate stats for a, for a Niagara system, which you can go into the details and then type auto-activate, um, if this is enabled and you respawn a Niagara system, it will fire again. So that's something to sort of keep in mind in that sense. Um, all right, so it's kind of most of the most of the points that I really wanted to hit here, and I, I know we're, we're a little bit further over to so. said. Yeah, it's that's no issues whatsoever. I've been making sure to get the questions kind of asked in between each demo, so we're cool. we're not falling behind on anything, and we're cool. we're looking good. All right. Well, that wraps me up for this. So um, I can hand that back over awesome. to you all. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. There were <laughs> there were a couple points, especially at the beginning, where I saw chat lighting up with, oh, my God, what do you mean? I wish I had known <laughs> about that six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's good. Yeah, right? That's why we're doing this. Yeah. yeah, there's there's always a checkbox you're missing that can potentially solve all of your problems. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's always something yeah, simple I've, and small. I have been burned by the save alpha one a few times. Um, definitely auto activate has uh, has made me look a bit of a fool during dailies sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you saw me struggle with that earlier. As you can see, I, I work more on the game side. Juan works more on the cinematic side, so he knows these sequencer tricks. And I was sitting there trying to figure it out myself last <laughs> night. Going, Juan, you're not online. Why are you not online? <laughs> yeah, I'd shut, I'd, I had. I think I'd shut off my 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 Slack later on in the evening, and you were like, "I need help." I'm like, "Oh, whoops." <laughs> It was this checkbox. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. And it it really is. It's always the small stuff like that that's easy to forget about or miss and then just absolutely breaks everything. It's great. <laughs> Gotta love it. You, usually you need to run into the problem once and then you will never have it again. Yeah. Like solving it the first time is always a... Yeah. I have the... Yeah, uh, the whatever I find something in Unreal, I have to tell people about it thing, like pinned camera cuts. <laughs> as soon as that happened, I was like, hey, everybody, you can do this. <laughs> and then and then I found out, you know, control C or shift C gets you in and out of the camera. I'm like, of course, of course, there was a hotkey that I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, we did have a question come in for you if you're up for it. Um, Swanthard is wondering if you have a master sequence with actors and a sub sequence within it, can you access BP skeletal mesh locations, etc., from the sub sequence, or does it need to be in the same sequence as the actor location? Oh, so so that can depend on a couple of different factors. First, are all of these possessable? If they're possessable, then they're and in the same level, or in the same sub-level, or I guess with World Partition, the same data layer, uh, yes, you can you can have them access, uh, or you can have them sort of access skeletal mesh location um, in that sub-scene uh, just with an attached track for, for that Niagara system to the skeletal mesh um, actor that you're trying to mess with. Now, if they're both spawnable, uh, they have to be in the same sub-scene, and you want to sort of um attach maybe a frame after the spawn so like at f instead of frame zero frame one just to be safe um uh in in that sort of regard if you have a skeletal mesh that's possessable and as and 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 a um system that's spawnable that's probably the simplest one because your system doesn't necessarily live in any data layer or or level so you can just attach that and it'll just glom onto that and be fine. Um, there's some weirder edge cases where you might need to do some sort of blueprint kind of soft reference stuff, but that's that's more for getting into advanced areas. But the short-ish answer is yes. <laughs> awesome. I hope that answers it. And, yeah, I... I feel like it answered what I understood of it. Um, but Swanthard, I'm sure, will let us know if, if it's otherwise. Um, I have one question for all of you, my dear guests. Do you have 15 more minutes of your time? Or do you have other things that you need to skedaddle off to real quick? Um, Adam, I should I'm be okay. Fine. I have time. Yeah. I'm good. Awesome. To, think, I'm good to stay. Uh, stay my, my dinner may have already arrived, but it's being kept warm, so I'm good. Oh no! <laughs> That's fine. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, good thing is I'm not hungry yet. So, but enough about that. I will order you a pizza or something to make up for it. I promise. Fresh. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, awesome. Well, if you have the time, then we do have one last segment, and it is a pre recorded video from our friends over at Side Effects. They also had a short demo that they were going to show off for today. Um, and if y'all are up for it, we can we can spin that up and then answer just a couple more questions at the end. And how are we all feeling about that? Sounds all right. Awesome. Yeah, sounds good to me. Of course. Awesome. All right, then we'll spin up a demo from our friend Muhammad over at Side Effects, who I believe is actually in chat um, to answer questions if anyone has questions while the video is playing as well. So, Dan, if you don't mind rolling that for us. Vertex animation texture crowds. So how is that different from standard animations? Standard animations use skeletal mesh animations. 
And that is CPU heavy. If you have too many of it, uh, the frame rate will drop or it might just crash. So instead, uh, we uh, bake all this uh, animation data into a texture and then we uh, loop over that texture as a flipbook in the engine to move the uh, world position offset uh, kind of like uh, grass wind but uh, for characters or anything else um, in this case you store the vertex xyz data into pixel form as rgb and you loop back over it so I used these uh, characters, and that's the animations, that's the output from Houdini. So two meshes, uh, one megabyte each, you use the vertex animation texture export, you have two textures, and it's eight megabytes each, roughly. And that's the shader cost, it's the screen, the uh, frame rate is 60, and you have two LODs. The last LOD is just a box. So in total, about so two meshes, two textures, about 18 megabytes. Animations. So the first uh, purple boxes up there are all the animations so we got the, all the animations from uh, asset pack and then brought it into houdini and used uh, motion clips to uh, blend between those two animations so the mo the animation goes into the motion clip and then i calculate how many frames are in, in it uh, it's just based on how many points because the motion clip uh, splits your animations into geometry and each geometry is just a point and then you know how many points is that that's how many frames then you blend both uh, uh, animations together with uh, some blending like uh, 10 frames before and after okay after i have all the animations i then do the characters i split them into multiple pieces and reduce the vertices on them and give them a vertex color. Uh, the vertex color, uh, I use it to uh, swap the uh, meshes. So if I want a different pants or different t shirt, things like that. Uh, with KinFX, you could also add other objects to the characters. So with a joint by harmonic capture, I can add uh, props. To the hands and they can follow the skeleton and i can turn them on and off in the engine uh, because I, I gave them a vertex color so uh, in this case i'm also doing that for the female character just multiple t-shirts and pants and all of that then you could see how they're all layered on top of each other. So technically they're all always there, but I hide some of them and I keep the others uh, visible uh, just based on the numbers uh, of which one I want. And I put that, plug that into the opacity mask. And I can do that with this uh, type of blending. Uh, it's almost like a lerp, but it's not really uh, doesn't really have a gradient it's more like on and off on and off and with multiple uh, inputs uh, I wrote an article about this a while back vertex deformation I'm getting all the character meshes the animations and the skeleton plug all those three into a bone deform and then you can see your character moving even with all the props you added to the character LODs so we're gonna reduce the point count, but we don't want to lose the point number. Uh, so we store that in a, into a float variable first, then uh, freeze the time at frame one, then reduce. Uh, we'll reduce uh, multiple times. Uh, here, in this case, I have two LEDs. 
like three uh, LED zero, one, and two. And each one of those uh, has a point group, and that's how uh, the vertex animation tool can know which one is which. Then I grab back that uh, point number with an attribute copy and a match attribute checked. Then cast that into an integer. Here I try to use a poly reduce to reduce the poly count to as little as possible, but uh, the poly reduce doesn't go beyond a certain level. So I just created that myself from uh, a box. And then I snap that with a minimum position uh, to the original mesh. And then transferred the, those uh, point numbers back and did the same thing after. Uh, this is. Uh, some good documentation by my uh, the labs team it's an art station you can find uh, more there and i copy the same setup to to the leds so for the these boxes uh, since i'm creating them from scratch they don't really have any uh, vertex uh, color information so I added that here myself vertex animation textures let's take a look at the uh, export options I'm using a soft body uh, so the point numbers are uh, not changing I'm exporting the color vertex color and uh, geometry and position and I have two LEDs uh, I'm using a retime node to speed up the animation before I put it into engine to lower the uh, texture size and then I slow it down in engine. You see here the import settings and the texture has to be uh, HDRI. You have options here to uh, like smooth the animation with interpolation but uh, I prefer it in this case to be choppy. It's more like an animated uh, yeah, stop motion type of look. Material. I'm using an unlit material, so it's going into the emissive color. That's the part up there. Uh, the position uh, texture is going into the world position offset, and the uh, vertex colors are going into the opacity mask. Okay. Uh, I exposed the position textures because I wanted two of them in the same material. So this is this part I changed uh, from the original. Uh, a function provided by side effects labs i'm not using any lerps they can get a little bit expensive uh, and in this case i'm not really lerping between uh, two values i'm just switching so i could uh, multiply by the opposite to switch so custom primitive data that's really useful if you want to uh, change parameters on uh, meshes, but you don't want to uh, have multiple material instances. So same material, but different values per mesh simply by exposing uh, some custom primitive data. And the way you do it is just uh, you turn the parameter into a custom primitive data and you have an index. I think there is about uh, maybe 35, that's the limit per mesh. So if you have different materials, uh, each material has uh, 35 limit uh, for primitive data which is more than enough you could uh, uh, play with uh, a lot uh, when you have 35 variables and each variable you can also use it as multiple variables depending on how hacky you do the, the math in the material that's the material instance itself if you change it the whole material will change so you could see how uh, all the characters uh, have the same material but can also be edited separately uh, using custom primitive data which is amazing in this case uh, we don't have to have multiple draw calls uh, for ha when like if you have multiple materials it's only one material and you can still have so many different uh, variations the uh, vertex color is going to this function uh, it's also using those cheap lerps, but in this case, uh, it's taking this gradient from 0 to 1. In this case, it's the vertex color. So this gradient from 0 to 1 is remapped uh, 
in a way that I can isolate the decimal points. 0 0.1, you're this color. 0 0.2, you're that color. You're 0 0.3, and so on. In this case, I'm using vertex color to do that, but it can be anything. In this case, uh, for color variation, I'm using it. Uh, I'm using the texture coordinate uh, from 0 to 1 on the x-axis, uh, multiplied by the actor position. And that what, that's what's giving this variation in color uh, for each part of the mesh, for each character, based on their position in space. Okay, the that, that, that second part is a, gra a gradient. You can see the difference between on and off. Uh, the skin color is masked by a zero vertex color. The directional light is a dot product between a random vector and the vertex normals. Uh, and the uh, animations are also shifted based on actor position. This is another vertex animation texture that is more organic. It's still using soft body, so the point count is still uh, intact, that doesn't change. I used a pop to uh, animate the points according to a line and some scattered points. Then uh, used an add to uh, form the polylines from those points and resample to make sure the point count doesn't change. Um, and you can see the wrangle here has different P scale uh, with a ramp, and that ramp, uh, each point is animated to make it look like uh, the uh, tubes are uh, getting bigger and smaller. With a carve node, I can end it at the end, like uh, carve in the lines to fade them out. Uh, with a channel, uh, I can smooth the animation so that the full animation timeline would get smoother. Uh, polyline to get the geometry smooth, some normals, and at the end just transform it into a tiny, tiny point. Finally, uh, speed up the animation to export less textures with vertex animation textures. Then in Unreal, bring in the mesh and the two textures, position and rotation in this case, with the correct uh, import settings, and there you go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mohammed, for that video and walking through those uh, different pieces. There's a lot of that. I'm not going to lie. I had no idea of it existed, <laughs> which is awesome. Oh, right. on, you're muted. <laughs> oh, we actually used, sorry about that. We actually used a um, similar sort of situation, a similar sort of setup for. Um, Sorry, the seasons. Chapter three, season three. 
where we had large crowds in the background. Um, some of our really, really talented tech artists like kind of worked with the VAT system and built something that, that worked to give, give us some really good for all that stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like that is very, very powerful, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Well, I know we're already over time, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I have one final question that I would like to pose to all of you. And that is if you had one piece of advice for anyone who is going to attempt to start this challenge, what would that advice be for them? Right. It's a hard gonna, one, I know. Steal. It came out swinging. <laughs> Should have warned here. us. <laughs> and it's just going to be on the same idea of the fail hard, fail, fail fast stuff of just iterate. Iterate on on a couple of uh, iterate and and um, block it out first. Write it down or think about it a little bit before you get into engine and or or if you do feel lost, step back out of engine and kind of take a look at it. And don't Absolutely. be afraid. <clears throat> I would say probably don't be afraid to use um, to start from existing effects. If you have an effect, even if it's just one of the Niagara templates, the fountain effect that's in Niagara, don't be afraid to start with something like that and sort of analyze it, look at it, try to you know make sure you understand what the the different things you're doing. Um, you know, I was thinking back when 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 Jan was talking that once I understood UV space and the UV coordinates which was a huge mental leap for me. I don't know about yeah. anybody else, but once I understood that, suddenly I was like, I understand how to do all this now. <laughs> um, yep, yep, it compounds. Yeah. But don't, a, be, yeah don't be afraid to start with, with an existing thing and then just start playing around with it and seeing, you know, if you find, you find yourself going in a direction that's like, oh, I really like this, figure out what you did that you like about it, what, what's causing that, and then just sort of carry on. I'm, my advice is going to be, maybe I have more than one piece of advice, but like the most important thing is, um, get involved in the community, right? Connect with people who are passionate about the same stuff that you like, that you enjoy doing, um, get on discord, get on the forums, get on like the various different, uh, unreal community venues that exist, um, connect with people, show them what you're doing. Like, even if you think um, this is not great. This is like, uh, I'm a beginner and I'm, I don't really want to show this. It doesn't matter. Most people that I have, uh, run into in the community have been super helpful and super happy to help someone, um, who's just starting out. Um, and that is really kind of the fastest way to get better, right? Um, show your stuff to others, get feedback, implement that feedback and, uh, yeah, try stuff, make stuff and have fun while doing it. I'll yeah. keep it to yeah, that. Yeah, definitely don't be afraid to show it. Don't be afraid to show it, especially yeah. people that have run into those problems or 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 may know something about it because there you might know somebody that has already run into the run into the same wall you were running into and they figured it out a week or two ago and they'll be like, "Ah, it's that check <laughs> Oh, here do these yep. four steps in your material and you'll be good or something like that. And that'll save you a day and a half time. <laughs> so, so many things that, that look like, um, skill are just having run into a problem before. Like you just, <laughs> they stood right where you're standing right now, didn't know what to do. And then they figured it out or maybe someone else helped them and now they know how to solve it. So it looks like they know what 100% agree that like people have asked me, how do you know that? I'm like, I've just run into that wall more times <laughs> than you have. That's all. <laughs> yeah. I got there a little, I smashed into it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah just last week but yeah basically um get connected and um get involved and show people your stuff absolutely all absolutely fantastic pieces of advice and to add on to that i do want to reiterate on that this is a community challenge right so this is a challenge 
made specifically for you as the community to dive into something that maybe you haven't done before or you want to learn more about and explore that topic a little bit further. So yes, please do post in the forums or on your social media or wherever to get involved, get feedback, and really learn and enjoy yourself. That is ultimately the goal of these challenges every time that we do them. So hopefully you all had fun watching this stream, learning a lot. There is so much information packed into these couple of hours. This was basically a crash course on VFX <laughs> over, you don't, you don't even have to go for your bachelor's degree anymore. You can learn everything you need to from the past three hours here alone. That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, and I'll set um, you straight. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And if you missed any part of the stream or you need to rewatch part of it because there is a lot of information, no worries. We save all of our videos as all of our streams, there we go, all of our streams as videos that we post to both our Twitch and YouTube channels. And that includes all of the chat and all of that. So if you ever need to go back, rewatch something or see part that you missed, know that you can do that on either channel. That is absolutely available to you. Also, don't forget to keep up with us at Unreal Engine on all social media, as well as come say hi on our forums where you can get the latest news and find all of the links associated with today's stream, as well as that that's where you'll be able to find all the stipulations for the challenge. You can read all of the prizes, all of the um, bits and bobs in regards to applying, and then of course submitting, which again, final note on the time, we have changed the submission deadline from midnight to 7 p.m. So again, please keep note of that. It's a little change, but I feel like it's gonna rock a few people's worlds. So <laughs> please make sure you keep note of that. Um, and on that note, yes. thank you everybody so much for watching and participating. The show wouldn't be what it is without you and your um, support for everything that we do here. And last but certainly not least, thank you all to our incredible guests who came on today and shared your wisdom with us and hung out and answered questions and did all this for almost three hours now. I, I cannot thank you enough for the time that you have spent with us and the information that you have given to us ah, today. This has been fun. Thank so yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have Friends. one more I have one more tip. Subtract one okay. day from the deadline. And then use that as midnight. <laughs> midnight the day yeah. before <laughs> to get your final. And then when you render it and it's broken, you have a few hours to be able to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Always build a yes. buffer. It is probably the best piece of advice we could give you today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The deadline is, is two days before the deadline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For sure. Well, on that final bit of extreme wisdom, thank you so much, Juan. Um, we're gonna, we'll, we'll end it there for today. So I'll see all of you next week for the next Inside Unreal episode, as well as our next episode of UELFG, our new show. Um, so see y'all then. And in the meantime, thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Go make Bye. cool stuff.